This is, without question, the earliest start time for any of my live streams. Um, I think my latest start time so far has been 4.30 p.m. Chicago time. And right now it's about 10, 15 a.m. The reason I'm coming early, my, my default time, I want to be, I want my live streams to start somewhere between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. I'm starting this one early because I have three uh, consultations, client consultations this afternoon. And I got them booked back to back to back to back, starting with 1 o'clock. Chicago time. I got three consultations back to back to back. That's how I spend most of my weekdays is doing Skype, Zoom, or telephone consultations with clients. Let me see who I got. Oh, I want to test out something. I bought a new microphone. This was my old microphone. It was called a Blue Snowball. Blue Snowball was my old microphone I used up until my very last live stream. Now I bought a new microphone. So uh, let me know in the chat room how it sounds. Number one, is the volume okay? If it's okay, press number one. If it's too low, press number two. If it's too loud, press number three. If my microphone sounds good, if the audio is okay, and particularly the volume, if the volume is right where it should be, press number one. If it's too low, press number two. If it's too loud, press number three. Okay, I'm getting a lot of ones so far. Getting a lot of ones so far. Good, good, good. Yeah, this is my... Uh, well, let me see if I can move it and show it to you. This is my brand new microphone. This is my brand new microphone. Just got it yesterday. Yeah, this is my brand new live stream microphone. And it it's going to replace again my now my my blue snowball. I've been using this since 2017, so it did me good for four years, four plus years. Yeah, my blue snowball. But I decided to upgrade my microphone game. And uh, let me see who I oh now okay I'm gonna start off. <clears throat> with shout outs and feedback related to one or more of my previous live streams. Excuse me. Now the guy criticized me in respect to my last live stream. This is the second time within the last few weeks where somebody criticized me about doing shout outs. One was in my Patreon exclusive live stream about, I don't know, about, I want to say about a month and a half ago. I had a guy that criticized me during my Patreon exclusive live stream because those last an average of two hours. And I had a guy criticize me. He said, Alan, I'm a fairly new Patreon subscriber and I got a problem with you. He said, you spent about 30 to 45 minutes of your two hour Patreon exclusive live stream doing greetings and shout outs, greetings and shout outs. And he said, you, you, you need to change that. You need to spend more time answering your Patreon subscribers questions than doing greetings, cordial pleasantries and shout outs. And now in respect to my last YouTube live stream, I had a guy say that. He said, Alan, you spent like 20, maybe as long as 25 minutes doing greetings and shout outs, man. What's that about? I don't know if I'm going to be tuning in to you again because you spent too much time doing greetings and shout outs. Well, I'll say this. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. But here, here's my simple thing. If I'm not going to do any greetings or shout outs at all, then I might as well just do pre-recorded videos. <laughs> I mean, real talk. 
if you're not going to do greetings or shout outs, you might as well just do pre-recorded videos. I mean, I think anytime you, you do a live stream, at minimum, you should take at least 5, 10, 15 minutes to greet your chat, the, the people in your chat room and do some shout outs of people that are, you know, loyal supporters of yours. That's just my feeling. Again, I said everybody's entitled to their opinion. Now, the person who criticized me, I'm not going to go in on them. That person's entitled to their opinion. But, like, I'll give you an example. <laughs> There's a young brother. I mentioned him a couple times before. I don't know his real name. His pseudonym is The Lead Attorney. The Lead Attorney. And he was doing a live stream yesterday where my name was mentioned a few times. and. This brother is clever. This brother, you think I spend a long time sometimes doing greetings and shout outs. Man, the lead attorney in his live stream yesterday, he must have spent probably the first hour and even as long as the first hour and 15 minutes of his live stream just doing greetings and shout outs. And I'm not even exaggerating. If he puts it up, I saw he take it down. If he uploads it again in its entirety, you'll see what I'm talking about. Literally, he spent somewhere between a, the first hour and hour of 15 minutes doing nothing but greetings and shout outs. And to his credit, man, this dude, this is where I say he's clever, man. People love to super chat him, man. I would say in his first hour, I don't know that it, Exact number, this is an estimation. I would say he probably cleared at least a thousand dollars in super chats in the first hour of his live stream, just doing greetings and shout outs. I was like, damn. I was watching that like just amazed, man. Yeah, he spent like again, like roughly an hour, hour and 15 minutes just doing greetings and shout outs. And in that hour, hour, 15 minutes, he probably cleared over $1,000 in Super Chats. And speaking of Super Chats, I got Fun P Ranks TV, $4.99. Thank you for that. If a woman seems to like the idea of casual sex, that means she is a manipulative time waster or reciprocator. Well, it depends on if her interest in casual sex is genuine or disingenuous. Genuine or disingenuous. If a woman, if you express interest in having casual sex with a woman and she responds by seeming like she's also interested in having casual sex, if she's genuine, of course, that would be a reciprocator. If she's disingenuous, that would be a manipulative time washer. And that's part of the point of my mo one coaching is to help you determine the difference between a reciprocator and a manipulative time waster. Well, that's, that's part of the whole basis of my particular brand of dating coaching. Cause again, as most people know, I got five archetypes, reciprocator, rejector, wholesome pretender, erotic hypocrite, and uh manipulative time waster. And when I do my coaching, particularly my one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching, which I haven't done in a while, I'll keep everybody posted when I resume that. I haven't done that in like two years. Um, that's one of the things I do in my one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching sessions is I'll have usually have a female assistant and I'll have my client do role play. And the role play is designed to help them quickly identify and distinguish between a reciprocator, and a manipulative time waste. Here's the two most of my five archetypes. Here's where men confuse the most, have a hard time deciphering which one is which. One I just mentioned, a lot of men I know, including, of course, most of my clients, they have a hard time distinguishing between um, a reciprocator and a manipulative time waster. And see, this relates to one of my criticisms of indirect verbal game. See, when you use indirect verbal game with women, you're going to have an exceptionally, not just a challenging time, 
But I would go as far as saying exceptionally challenging time differentiating between a genuine reciprocator and a disingenuous manipulative time waste. When you use indirect, that's that's one of the major weaknesses, if not the major weakness of indirect verbal game. It's going to take you a long, long, long time to distinguish between a reciprocator and a disingenuous manipulative time waster. The second most uh, two archetypes that tend to be confused with one another is rejector and erotic hypocrite. I've seen a lot of men make the mistake of confusing and mistaking an erotic hypocrite for being a rejector. An erotic hypocrite for being a rejector. If I had to use a simple example of that, Again, I refer back to my initial inspiration, the movie Talk Dirty to Me, the, the infamous scene with Jack and, and the female doctor. That woman, if you paid attention to some of her early responses, you would have thought she was a rejector. She was criticizing Jack, insulting Jack, and the most extreme thing she did at one point is she threatened to call the police on him. She threatened to call the police on him. Most guys, if you pause the video right there and you ask guys, what is she? Most guys will say, oh, she's a rejector. But she wasn't. She was an erotic hypocrite. She ends up sucking his dick. She was an erotic hypocrite. Y'all know the story about me and the, uh, the professor's assistant when I was at Indiana University, otherwise known as TA or teacher's assistant? She might have been, I've had a lot of women who were similar to that female doctor in that scene in Talk Dirty to Me, but probably one of the most notable is the, the TA I ended up having sex with when I was still a college student. In the same way that doctor at one point threatened to call the police on Jack, this teacher's assistant at one point, she threatened to report me to the main professor and have me suspended from college. Yeah, if most people in this chat room should know that story, but in case you never heard that story before, yeah. This woman literally, at one point in our conversation, she threatened to report me to the main professor and threatened me with the potential consequence of being suspended for a semester from college. And that's when I was on the verge. I was that close to apologize. You know, one of my rules in my more one book, if you own it, is never apologize for anything bold you said or anything sexually provocative you said. That's one of my rules. Never apologize. Once it comes out your mouth, don't ever apologize for it. I came that close when she threatened to have me suspended from college to apologize. And then my little mole one voice said, nope, don't apologize. Anyway, long story short, man, a week and a half later, not only did I end up having sex with her, I ended up having sex with her and one of her girlfriends. I ended up having a threesome with her. Now, see, if I didn't have the mole one knowledge and wisdom that I do, I would have immediately thought that woman was a rejector. So anyway, that's the two type of my archetypes. That's the two that get conflated for each other. A lot of manipulative time wasters are mistaken for being reciprocators. And a lot of uh, erotic hypocrites are mistaken for being rejectors. You just got to know your women, man. You got to know your women. You got to know your women. Let me get a few more shout outs. I'm not going to do too many since, you know, I'm getting criticism. I got Craig Tomahawk. That's one of my trusted moderators. He's in my chat room. I got Joe. Joe. I got Jeremy Warner. Another, all three of these are trusted moderators of mine. Chesamine is in my chat room. Iceberg S. Mouthology all day is in my chat room. He's one of my trusted moderators as well. Dada Saints, number one is in my chat room. I got Jay from Connecticut. He says, shout out to Unc. The possibility of sex was an ultimate read for me. Love the way you broke down and explained things. The audiobook is a true treasure. Thank you so much for that compliment. Thank you so much, Jay from Connecticut. I got Chill Sentenza in... Uh, 
I forget the name of that song, Chill. I got to look it up again. I used the song in the intro and I can't remember. Golly. It's in it's in the description section though. Yeah, I got I give credit in the in the if you look at my description. So speaking of my description section, since people been on me about announcing my cash app and PayPal. And I received some after my live stream, which I'm real appreciative of. Thank you guys. Yeah, about a half a dozen guys sent me, I think I have four guys that sent me Cash App donations and two guys that sent me PayPal donations. That's the first of my live streams I've gotten those. Um, you know, there's a button that says thanks underneath the screen that's similar to a Cash App or a PayPal donation. But YouTube, they take like one third of the money for that. So I'd rather you send me Cash App or uh, PayPal rather than do that thanks thing. Because, yeah, YouTube, they, they they make sure. It's just like Super Chats. I don't know if you know this, but, yeah, YouTube, if I get like $100 Super Chat, YouTube takes somewhere between 30 to $35 of that. Yeah, they take roughly about one third, somewhere between 30 to 35 percent, if I'm not mistaken, of my super chats. But you know, hey, YouTube ain't on here just to help people have fun. They, they on here. You, Google is all about making money. Google, who owns YouTube, all about making money. Um, but yeah, I appreciate those uh, cash apps I got after my last live stream, and the, and the two uh, PayPal donations I got after the last live stream. Deanna Barnes, that's my home girl from Gary, Indiana. That's right. Got love for my Gary, Indiana peeps. Um, L. Nixon is in my chat room. Player B is in my chat room. Mo one for life. Mo one. For life. Uh... <laughs> God effects that ARC isn't even right near as big. Now, I don't want to per se criticize TLA for what he does. I mean, he does what he does. Obviously, he, he's working. It, it works for him. But under the criticism of taking a long time doing greetings and shout outs, man. Dude, like I said, I watched his live stream yesterday, man. I was paying close attention to how he does things, particularly since I'm in the live streaming now. I want to, you know, find ways to pick up Jeff. Yeah, man, he spent about, at bare minimum, an hour, if not an hour and 15 minutes, just doing greetings and shout outs. And in that span of time, this young brother cleared about a, over a thousand dollars in super chat earnings i've heard him say he makes like a minimum of twenty five thousand dollars a month on youtube he yeah he makes a minimum of about twenty five thousand dollars a month on youtube and um but yeah man he was getting like super chat after super chat after super chat after super chat what he does that's also kind of clever on his part he turns super chat into a competition like whoever super chats him the highest amount for that particular live stream they're called the sponsor of that live stream the sponsor so you have a number of people that will be trying to give him more and more money so that they can be called the sponsor of his live stream. But yeah, so uh, I, I say this, if, if people are impatient about the host of a live stream getting to the main topic, they never want to listen. <laughs> they ain't going to never want to listen to the lead attorney, man. I'm telling you, they ain't going to never want to listen to him. Okay. Now, this is interesting. Normally, I wouldn't put this on the screen, but this is interesting. This guy named Lou says, there's no point in knowing about Mo One if there are no women <coughs> to practice it on.
Well, Lou, where do you live? In Siberia? I mean, do you live in a in a some kind of rural? I don't know if I pronounced it right. Rural area, farmland area where there's just no women around. And there are some areas in the in the world like that. Like you know, for example, in the United States, one state I know for a fact that has more men than women is Alaska. Yeah, Alaska has I think five single men for every three or four single women. San Diego was like that. My brother used to live in San Diego. Do you know, according to this, this is way back in the 90s, according to their census in the 90s, I don't know how it is now, it might have changed. But in the, in the mid to late 1990s, there were actually more single heterosexual men who lived in San Diego than single heterosexual women. What does that usually lead to? A lot of guys getting married quick in a mug. Yeah, typically, there might be exceptions here and there, but generally, anytime a guy lives in a city where there's more men than available women, you're going to have a higher rate of marriage. That's when you're going to have a higher rate of marriage, usually, in that city. And just the opposite. If you live in a city where there's like, say, three times as many women, like say, I don't know, you live in a large metropolis where there's three million women and only one million men, those men aren't going to be motivated to get married because they're going to feel like, shoot, there's two, two million more women than there are men? Shoot, I'm going to try to get as much pussy as possible. But Lou, I would just simply say that statement is only valid depending on where you live. Depends on where you live. I'm looking at some of the... Yeah, re rejectors are honest. Well, this is one thing I agree with, Lou, the same guy. He said rejectors are honest. I agree with that. Hey, man, I'm going to tell you something, and I, I've said this before. Oh, yeah, I wanted to have John Leslie. I wanted to interview John Leslie, like, real super bad. Nina Hartley, who most of you young guys might not be familiar with, she used to be the Meryl Streep of porn. She was going. She was in the process of setting it up for me because I interviewed her on Blog Talk Radio. And she's a legendary actress in the porn industry. She was going to set it up for me. And while she was in the process of setting up me interviewing John Leslie, he, he unfortunately passed away. Broke my heart, man. That would have been my most significant interview ever, man. Broke my heart. Yep. At the time he passed away, Nina Hartley was actually in the process of setting him up to become a guest on my blog talk radio show, Up Front and Straightforward. And yeah, he while she was in the process, he, he ended up passing away. D. Wee says, your old prediction is coming true, AFC. The world is ready. Hell yeah, it's ready for more one. That brings me a quick side note story. I think I mentioned this story a few times. I remember I did a book signing event in, in Southern California in 2006. And there was this comedian there who had been on, appeared on Deaf Comedy Jam. And... Um, he read my book. And we were, we were at some downtime. We were just chilling. And he said, so Alan, man, I read your book. I said, well, let me know what you think. I forget what his name is. I think his name was Mark something. I can't remember his last name. His first name was Mark. He had appeared on Deaf Comedy Jam. And he had, yeah, he was a stand-up comic. And uh, I said, so give me some feedback. What did you think about my book? And he said, Alan... This is an excellent book. Your book, Mo One, is an excellent book. But here's what I would say. I said, what? He said, the world ain't ready for Mo One right now. Those are his exact words. This is, Again, this was in summer of 2006. He said, the world ain't ready for Mo One right now. He said, my prediction 
He said, your book is not going to blow up until probably about 10, 15, 20 years from now. That's what he said. He said that in 2006. He said, your book, Mo One, your whole Mo One philosophy is probably not going to blow up until about 10, 15, even 20 years from now. He said, but right now, which again was summer 2006, he said, the world ain't ready for Mo One, man. This, this is too much of a drastic departure from people's sensibilities. He said, people ain't ready for Mo One right now. Both men and women. He wasn't just talking about women. He was talking about men too. He said, most, not only most women are not ready for Mo One. He said, most men aren't ready for Mo One right now. But he said, yeah, he said 10, 15, 20 years from now. He, you know, that happened with, um, I may mention before, if you're in the diet books, I, I used to be a big fan of a guy named Robert Atkins. He was the author of The Atkins Diet. That was the first real popular book on low-carb dieting. Because before that, before Robert Atkins came on the scene, everything was about either just low-calorie dieting or low-fat. Low-calorie or low-fat. He was the first one to come along and emphasize low-carb diet. Do you know his first book? He wrote his first book. He published his first book in 1969. And over the next roughly 20 years, people called him crazy. People literally in the diet industry called him crazy. They, they literally thought he was a loon. They thought he was crazy. Because society wasn't ready for a low-carb diet at that time. So between roughly 1969 and the late 80s, early 90s, his book did not, I bought his book in summer of 1992, and it worked. I, I was getting ready to go to a wedding, and I wanted to lose about 15 to 20 pounds. And I tried his low-carb diet and lost weight quicker than I ever had. And then about two or three years later after I bought the book, I bought it again in summer 1992. It was around 1994, 1995, when his book just exploded. Everybody in the diet industry was talking about the Atkins diet. I mean, like everybody was talking about the Atkins diet. He made the cover of Time magazine and everything. Everybody was talking about the Atkins diet by the mid-90s. And then what happened? What do I always bitch about? Next thing you know, all these copycats came out of, <laughs> out of nowhere. You had all these like basically Atkins copycats coming out the woodworks, writing their own book about low carb diets, man. And I was like, man. So sometimes I compare myself to him. Um, but yeah, man, for the first 20 years after he published his first version in the book, man, people called him crazy, man. They thought he was nuts promoting a low carb diet. Um, Cold Steel, what's happening? Happy Universe, Cash App, yeah, again. My cash app is in my description section. My uh, PayPal is in my description section. Again, after my last live stream, I received four cash apps and two PayPal donations. So I, I, I really uh, appreciate that. Um, Mystery Man, the Liberator. Now, Cole still says, my man, the lead attorney is blue pill. I don't know if I, I don't know about enough about his beliefs and attitudes about dating relationships to know what pill he is. But I'm going to say this, man, love him or hate him. When it comes to the business of live streaming, forget the actual substance of his content, just focus on the business side of live streaming. The lead attorney knows what he's doing, just like Kevin Samuels. I did a video complimenting Kevin Samuels in that regard uh, earlier this year. Uh, I, I, I gave Kevin Samuels his props. I didn't give him props on his dating advice or his relationship advice. But the one thing I gave him props on is just the, his strategic business sense as it relates to growing his channel through live streaming. There's nobody in the space who can criticize Kevin Samuels in that regard. 
You might be able to criticize him on specific aspects of his actual content, the quality and substance of his content. But in terms of his ability to strategically grow his channel through the use of live streaming, nobody can criticize Kevin Samuels, man. He know, and TLA is the same way. He knows there's certain guys in the space that know the business side of YouTube live stream. Like, see, that's where I would honestly openly say I'm weak. My, I, I, I know for a fact my quality of my content is excellent. I get feedback all the time on the quality of my content. So I don't have no issues with the quality and substance of my content. My, my weakness is, is just knowing the business side of YouTube live streaming. I'm like a novice at the business side of YouTube live streaming. I met Nina Hartley in person when I lived in LA. You, now this is going to blow some of y'all mind. You know, there was that one time I was going to uh, try to enter into the porn industry. <laughs> now, most of y'all, of course, assuming I'm talking about as a, as a male porn star. No, not as a porn star. Um, as an actual performer, but I wanted to become a writer slash director slash producer in the porn industry. Yeah, that was a period of time. I think it was what, around 1998. I, I was seriously thinking about becoming, trying to become a writer, director, and producer in the porn industry. And Nina Hartley had this workshop about breaking into porn. And we ended up having this long conversation and she told, she told me a lot of things. Basically, she told me that unless I was going to be financing the projects myself, it would be hard for me to break into the porn industry as a writer, director, producer. She, she classified it as a old boys network. And she said, and I kind of knew this already, but she said, there's a lot of mobsters who work in the porn industry. A lot of a lot of porn is ran by wealthy mafia types. In more recent years, you've had a lot of people break out on their own and finance their own projects, so those wouldn't be included. But just like in, in mainstream filmmaking, you have studio movies and you have independent filmmaking. Independent filmmaking means simply that you, you were able to get money to finance your own project, your own movie project which is what I wanted to be. I still have aspirations of doing some filmmaking. Yeah, to be an independent filmmaker, you got to have your own financing. If 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 you want to make a movie, but you don't have any money to finance it, then, of course, you got to pitch it to a studio, like a Paramount, a Warner Brothers, a Universal Pictures, 20th Century Fox. Well, 20th Century Fox is now owned by Fox. Uh, I mean, no. who Disney now owns 20th Century Fox. They just bought them up. Disney is the big bully in, in the world of studio financing. Disney, <laughs> they just be punking everybody. And um, yeah, when you want studio financing, they're going to determine what they like and dislike about your script. If it will get made, when it will be distributing so i don't want to get into a filmmaking class speaking of giving kind of education about things i had a lot of guys write me after my last live stream and actually give me props on when i was breaking down the the ins and outs of, of brand marketing i was kind of pleasantly surprised by that yeah because my main topic of course was about Casual sex should never involve emotions. And I, I only ended up talking about that for like maybe the last 20 minutes, 25, no, maybe 30, maybe 30, last 30 minutes of the live stream. But my subtopic was about branding. And a lot of guys wrote me and said they felt like I was giving them a mini business one-on-one -on -one course. Because a lot of guys said a lot of stuff I talked about, they had no idea. And it made a lot of guys think. It made a lot of guys think. Um, 
There you go. There you go. There you go. Aracy, I always remember what you said about women. Their mind is socially programmed to refuse sex. I would say more specifically, not just sex, but short-term non-monogamous casual sex. Yeah. Women, the vast majority of women in society are socially programmed and culturally conditioned to refuse anything representative of short-term non-monogamous schedule. And I'm going to get into that with my main topic. Um, the, number one, the only way you're going to be able to bypass their social programming and cultural conditioning, and if you own my book, we'll say it again, you know the answer. In real, real simple terms, you got to have an exceptional mouthpiece. You got to be exceptional at verbal seduction and erotic dirty talk. The only other alternative is basically tricking. But a lot of women who are from middle class, upper middle class backgrounds, they're not gonna they're not gonna respond favorably to tricking. No. Yeah. Yeah, the only way to overcome is various ways. It, it, there's there's mainly three ways, three to four ways to overcome women's socially programmed and culturally conditioned refusal for casual sex propositions. One is verbal seduction. Verbal seduction. is That's, that's my number one area of expertise. That's my number one area of expertise. Um... Second most way is monetary compensation and financial negotiation, otherwise known as tricking and whining and dining. Tricking and whining and dining. Then one other way that relates to indirect verbal game is just lying to a woman, making her believe that you actually want to be in a long-term relationship with her when you know deep down you really just want casual sex. And probably the most despicable alternative option to overcome a woman's socially programmed aversion to casual sex is physical force or drugs and alcohol, otherwise known in today's society as coercion and date rape. Coercion and date rape. So yeah, man. But yeah, the average woman in society is always going to be socially programmed and culturally conditioned to present herself to general public and more specifically to men in the general public as the proverbial good girl, relationship oriented, monogamy oriented, good girl. Yeah. But yeah, probably the most legal and inexpensive way to bypass that is you got to develop a mouthpiece, man. If you ain't got no mouthpiece, man, you, you you get that's when you're gonna have to result to one of those other alternatives I just mentioned. You're gonna have to result to one of those uh Mel says the world is ready for more one, but the media, mainstream media, is still not ready to promote red pill reality. The show Why the Last Man. They get canceled shortly. Just prove. I'm not familiar with that show. I'm gonna have to look look that up. No one is more relevant today than ever. Yeah, Jezebel. Yep, you're right. I bet you put that weight back on once you've done that diet. As low as as I'm just, yep. That I I I won't lie. Jezebel is right. Low carb diets. Here's what low. Here's the benefit of low carb diets and and the weakness of low carb diets. If you're looking to lose weight in a short period of time, say for to prepare for some type of event, like in my case, might be a speaking event I got coming up. Like when I spoke at the the 21 convention. Matter of fact, I want to touch on that real quick. Um, or I might be going being a groomsman in a wedding or whatever. Low carb diets work. So, in other words, short term, if you're just looking to lose weight for a, a specific event that's coming up in a few weeks or two or three months, low carb diets are great. 
But the problem, the weakness in a low carb diet is your body naturally has a, a strong desire and hunger for carbohydrates. That's the main, your body's main source of energy. So like if you want to do a lot of exercise and like you want to, you're a young guy, you want to go out and play a few games of, you know, five on five basketball at your local playground or whatever, or in the gym. Carbohydrates is, is like gas to a car. That's what gives you your energy. So your body naturally wants the carbs, man. And so it, it because of that, it makes it very challenging for you to maintain a low carb diet like indefinitely. And here's the, the real big problem, in, in, as Chesamane alludes to. Once you go back to eating carbs, not only will you gain all your weight back, let's say you lost 50 pounds on a low carb diet. Not once you start eating carbs again, not only are you going to gain those 50 pounds back, but you're going to gain and some. You're probably going to gain 75 pounds back. So let's say you gain 75 pounds back and then you do low carb again and you lose the 75 pounds. Once you start eating carbs again, you're going to gain 100 pounds back. You never gain the, the exact amount you lost. You usually gain the amount you lost plus some. Every time I went back to eating carbs, I would gain the amount I lost plus some. So that's why a lot of people are very critical of a low-carb diet as far as over a long, you know, indefinite period of time. But again, they work well when you're trying to lose weight for like for a specific event. I appreciate this super chat. I just finished listening to your audio book, The Possibility of Sex. That is your best book by far. 99% of people copy you and Rolo in the Manosphere. Um, yeah, that, I, I, of course, I love all my books. Asking me to pick my favorite book is like a, asking a mother or father to pick their favorite child. If you got five children, you're not going to say, hey, my child number two, that's my favorite. All the rest of my children, they just okay. I mean, <laughs> What mother and father would do that? Um, I love all my books, but I, it's funny. I get different opinions on which book is arguably the best. I've had each of my books be called the best book by at least a handful of people. I've had literally, the only exception would be my book, Up Front and Straightforward. I don't know if anybody's ever called my book, my paperback called Up Front and Straightforward. Let the manipulative game players know what you're really thinking. My best book. But as far as my major books, I mean, some guys have called Mo One, hands down, the best book I've ever written. I've had some guys call Who Say It Again, the best book they've ever read or listened to if they got the audio book. Um, that's definitely, I mentioned this on a previous slide, that's definitely women's favorite. I would say, hands down, women's favorite book of mine is Who Say It Again? That's the number one book, particularly the audiobook version, that I get the most compliments from women. Oh, speaking of that, I got to touch on that. So let me put a mental note, post-it note, mental post-it note. I want to talk about 21 Convention real briefly and uh, something to do with Who Say It Again. I've had some guys like, Daniel Roman say Possibility of Sex is the best book I've ever written and produced. I've had at least a handful of guys even rank um, The Beta Mount Revolution as the best book I've ever written. That's probably the lowest percentage, but still, I've had a handful of guys that have ranked The Beta Mount Revolution number one. And most recently, No Free Attention, which is technically a rewrite of the possibility of sex. I've had a, quite a few guys in the last few months. I'd say at minimum, I've had at least three dozen guys that have ranked No Free Attention as the best of my books. Matter of fact, I posted on my community page, there's one guy, if you go to Amazon Reviews, not only did he rank No Free Attention as the best of my books, he ranked No Free Attention as the best dating advice book he's ever read in his life. Real talk. 
There's at least one guy who wrote an Amazon review of No Free Attention. He said, this is probably the best dating advice book I have ever read in my entire life. And I've had a few guys that have echoed those sentiments about No Free Attention. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I say minimum about three dozen guys have told me they feel like No Free Attention is the best, number one, the best of my books. And just in general, they rank it in the top two, top three best dating advice books they've ever read, period. Period. Um, There's my man, JFC, in the chat room. Antoine Brown. This your first live. Glad you could join me. That's what it's about, stretching out the moles. Mo one. Shout out to uh actually I didn't create that stretching that out like that. The no one guy who first said it like that, like that chant, like Mo is a guy. Do I have a picture of him? Is a guy named Gerard McClendon. If you've met, some people should be familiar. He did the first YouTube video of me ever on YouTube. First time I ever appeared on YouTube related to my book, Mo One, was an interview I did in 2006. It was in September of 2006 by a guy named Gerard McClendon. This is Gerard McClendon. He was the one, Robert Clinton is the guy who first did, you could say, created the Mo One chant. The Mo One chant. Mo! Yeah, he had done, he did that interview of me. And as we were wrapping up the video, getting ready to go our separate ways, he just looked at me, he said, man. He said, Alan, thank you so much for that interview, man. He said, this Mo, he almost said the same thing as the other guy was talking about. He said something to the fact that he said, man, Alan, I got to tell you, I don't know if the world is ready for mold one. He said, but you making them ready. He said, but I think a few years from now, man, your mold one going to blow up, man. He said, I don't think it's going to blow up in like the very near future. But he said, I think in a few years, he said, man, everybody going to be talking about, and that's when he said Mo. He said, he said, in a few years, everybody going to be talking about Mo. I said, oh, I like that. I like that. And then I start using it. Then I start using it. Um, uh, there's my girl, Felicia Bailey. Okay. Since I saw Felicia Bailey, and she seems to have, her and Deanna Barnes have established herself as my most public female friend. Now, behind the scenes, I'm looking for more super chat. Oh, this is a thought I didn't finish. Sometimes I got a bad habit. Sometimes I'll have a thought. Like, let's say the letters A, B, C, D represent my thought I want to express. Sometimes I'll have a thought and I might express the A of A, B, C, D, or I might express the A and B of A, B, C, D. But then I get distracted by another thought and I kind of forget. And one thing I saw myself when I was watching myself, I always watch a replay of my live streams. And I was talking about when I had a female supporters group. And I was making a comment that I said, a lot of you all probably tend to assume that 95% of my people who follow me and support me are men, single heterosexual men. But I said, I have quite a few women. Do you know on Facebook, I've had two female supporters groups. Two female supporters groups. Let me look how many people right now are in my are in my male supporters group.
Okay, I got a decent number. Not super high, but decent. I got right now I got 545 members in my male supporters group, which I've had I've had that group since um I think 2008. Is it's called the Male Fans and Listeners of Upfront and Straightforward with Alan Roger Curry. Even though I have that show no more. That's for my blow to radio show. Um I've had two female groups. One between 2009 and 2011, and then another one between 2013 and 2016. Do you know the female supporters group I had between 2009 and 2011? I had more members in my female supporters group than I did in my male supporters group. At the time... Again, between 2009 and 2011, my highest number I had for my male supporters group was about 400. My highest number for my female supporters group was 600. Now, I had 600 women in my group between 2009 and 2011, including a lot of what I would call notable celebrities. I had like about... I had probably about 20 to 30 women in my female supporters group that were to one level or another level, you could say media and entertainment industry celebrities. Yeah, I had, um, because I used to interview a lot of celebrities on my on my show, Up Front and Straightforward. Yeah, I, I had a lot of female celebrities uh, that were following me. Then, because of some kind of change in their format, you, uh, Facebook shut that first group down. Then I restarted it in 2013. And even the one I had in 2013, I think the highest number I had was about 500, which at the time was still more than what I had in my male group. You would think a dating coach for men would be supported by far more men than he would women. But yeah, both times I had my female supporters group, I had more women in the, in the female supporters group than I did men in the male supporters group. Yeah, the second female supporters group. Oh, boy. <laughs> I ain't gonna go into too much detail, but it was wild, man. I mean, women used to share like nude or semi-nude pictures with me. They would be asking me pictures of, for pictures of my dick. Uh, they would share all kinds of, you know, kinky sex stories with me. See, here what you got to understand about women that some guys don't don't seem to understand. A few guys do, but some guys. See, when women, it's just like when women go to a, a male strip club. Women are going to be very uninhibited when they when they when they know they're around other kinky, freaky women. When women know they're around other kinky, freaky women and other kinky, non-judgmental men, that's when their real selves come out. Generally speaking, that's when women's real selves come out. See, here's when women are going to be very sexually duplicitous, put on the good girl role, is when they are either around other women who they feel are a combination of very prudish and highly judgmental, and when they're around men who they feel are very judgmental, indiscreet, or misogynistic. That's when women are going to hold back on their real sexual side. And they feel like they're in the company, again, of other women who are a combination of prudish and judgmental, or they feel like they're in the company of men who are a combination of judgmental, indiscreet, meaning they got a big mouth, and somewhat misogynistic. That's when they're going to hold back. They're going. That's when they're going to put on what I call the prudish good girl role. But like in my female supporters group, man, all the women, man, they let so figuratively speaking, they let their hair down. And lot, at least one fourth of the women in my group were married. They were either married, engaged, or married, or had a boyfriend. Like I had married women sending me pictures of them in lingerie. I had women who had boyfriends sending me videos of them playing with their pussy. 
in my female supporters group. I am not joking. Women were totally, because I was the only man in both groups. In the one I had between 2009 and 2011, I was the only man in the group. And in 2000, the one I had between 2013 and 2016, I was the only man in the group. And it's like women knew I was a non-judgmental type dude. They knew I was non-judgmental. They knew I was a kinky freak. So they felt relaxed sharing. Again, some of them shared pictures with me, either fully nude, partially nude. Some of them shared like stories of, of, of their experiences having casual sex. Some of them, yeah, man, it was it was a trip. It was a trip. Oh, but what made me think of my female supporters? Um, see, Felicia Bailey said facts. She knows she a woman. She know how women get down, man. This is what I love. I love when she called me the living legend. But um, yeah, man, I'm telling you, man, women. That's why you have sexually duplicitous women. Yeah, again, man, uh, I remember, if people remember this, some of my long time, really long time followers might remember this story. I remember when I first realized how women really were, I used the example of male strippers. I've never been a male stripper, but when I was a college student in 1985, I had, if I say so, I, was, I had this really lean, chiseled physique. I had probably like 3% body fat in my whole physique. So I had like this lean... I, my physique kind of looked like Brad Pitt in Fight Club would be my best comparison. I had a physique like Brad Pitt's physique in Fight Club in 1985, which is one of my top years for, for slaying pussy. And uh, this woman I knew, she worked at a lingerie shop. And she asked me, they were having a modeling show. And it was like about seven or eight female models, and it was three male models, including myself. Man. Man, them women was grabbing all on my ass, grabbing on my dick, and they didn't give a damn. They didn't give a damn. Because again, what I already said, man, women, when they know they're around other women that are kinky, free-spirited, open-minded, sexually liberated. In other words, they know they're not going to be judged by the other women they're around. Because how could they be? Because no woman is going to be judgmental in that type of environment by the simple fact that she's there. She would look stupid being judgmental. Just like at a male strip club performance. You look, if you were to be a judgmental type woman, people would be like, okay, why the fuck are you here? So just the fact that your presence means you're not a judgmental type. Yeah, man, women ain't totally different, man, when they're around other women that they know are kinky, free-spirited, open-minded, erotically uninhibited, and non-judgmental. But yeah, man, the women were so aggressive. See, most people in society think men are the aggressive ones when it comes to sex and stuff. Shit. Shit, that's what a lot of women want you to believe. Man, I'm telling you, man, those women's will... Uh, me and the other two male models, we were like tripping, man. They was like, they was grabbing on us, man, very aggressively. I mean, very aggressively. Like to the point where the women who worked for the lingerie shop had to basically tell them to cool out. They was like, okay, ladies, golly, what's wrong with you women? Control yourselves, control yourselves. Yeah, man, the women was just grabbing all on us, man. I told this story about um. There used to be this nightclub called in Chicago called Chick Rick House, and they used to have uh, once a month they would have male strippers come. Then all of a sudden I saw they had a sign, it said canceled indefinitely. So I was talking to one of the brothers that worked there, and I was just curious. Not that I wanted to go, but I was just curious when I saw the big. I said, "Hey man, obviously because I'm a man, I don't want to see no male strippers, but." I'm just curious, why, why did y'all cancel it? I see this big sign y'all got said cancel. And he just started laughing. First, he just started laughing. And then he shook his head. He said, brother, man, brother, 
I said, what? What? What's up? He said, man, related to what I just said about when I did that modeling, this guy said, he said, brother, man, he said, everybody likes to think it's us men who are the horny and aggressive ones. He said, anybody who believes that never been around women when they're in the company of male strippers. He said, man, we had to cancel shows, man, because he said, man, these women was damn near trying to rape these dudes. And I said, what? He said, man, I ain't even joking, man. I'm not even like exaggerating, man. Our last function we had here, we had three male strippers on stage, man. They was, you know, doing their routine. And these women, man, just, <laughs> just like bombarded their, uh, bogarted their way on stage, man. Even and we had at least a handful of security guys. They just like ran on stage, man, and pushed the guys to the ground, jumped on top of them, was trying to put the, 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 the strippers dicks in their pussy. I was like, shh. Are you in, in a way, I was acting surprised, but I wasn't totally surprised because, again, I, I knew from my modeling experience in 1985. But he, this brother at Chick Rickhouse was telling he said, yeah, man, these women, man. He said, I ain't talking about no ugly fat women either. He said, a lot of guys had this impression that the only women that are aggressive with men is women that are either ugly, fat, or both. Man, I'm talking about good-looking women. I'm talking about young, good-looking women was trying to rape our male strippers, man. We had to we had to stop the show mid-show. We had to stop the show mid-show. And that's why you see that sign that says canceled indefinitely. Because the strippers are like, man, I can't do this, man. Uh, Y'all need to protect me, man. I can't have a bunch of women running up on stage and grabbing me and pushing me down to the ground, jumping on me. I used to hang out with one of my buddies um, when I lived in L.A. I had a buddy that was a male stripper. Man, he used to show me some videos he had from when he would do private uh, bachelorette parties. Man, if you saw these videos, you would never look at women the same way again. And not just women, but specifically like middle class, upper middle class career-oriented, professional-type women. Because most of the women he would do private parties for, it wasn't no, like, just skanky-type women, you know, that work at, you know, Walmart or Target or something like that. These were women who were, like, lawyers, business, corporate business women, high-class-type chicks, man. Man, they would be grabbing on him, begging him to fuck them. And some of these women either had boyfriends, fiancés, or husbands. And they would be begging him. I mean, like, literally, literally, not figuratively speaking, literally. They would be like, oh, please fuck me. Please, please fuck me. Please fuck me. And he would always resist because he felt like actually fucking the women or allowing them to suck his dick would give him a bad reputation and in his career as a male stripper for hire. So he would always resist. I think there was like maybe a few times he didn't do anything at the actual event, but he did something with the women later. But um, but yeah, the videos, man, used to be a trip. Anyway, I got on a long digression. Um, I was going to say, I got some feedback. Since I've been doing my live streams, I'm starting to get more feedback from women. And uh, I mentioned my new microphone. I had a woman give me a lighthearted, mild criticism in the last couple of days. She said, Alan, I was listening to your last live stream. And she said, I've heard you before talk about your different voices you have. She said, what did she say? She called it my tense voice. She said, you were using what what I think you've called, Alan, yourself, your tense voice in a large part portions of your last live stream. She said it wasn't your relaxed voice. She said, because I think you know the voice all the ladies love is your erotic conversationalist voice. And I just, you know, wrote back, LOL. Yeah, because number one, I'm not the only person. A lot of people think I'm like the only person in the world who got multiple. 
really all human beings get probably, I'd say bare minimum, two different voices. And some have as many as three, four, five, six different voices. Um, if you're familiar with the black comedian named Bill Bellamy, that was his signature bit when he when he when uh some of you young people probably don't remember Deaf Comedy Jam. They used to come on in the 90s. But Deaf Comedy Jam, that's what made a lot of black comedians. That's what made Bernie Mac, you know, catapulted him to fame. Bill Bellamy, Chris, Chris Tucker, uh, Eddie Griffin, number of comics, uh, Martin Lawrence. Um, and yeah, Bill Bellamy, he had a bit on voices. He basically said, he said, fellas, have you ever noticed that whenever a woman call you, your voice just almost automatically changes versus one of your boys? He said, like, well, one of your boys call and say, Hey, Bill, man, you want to play basketball? you like, hey, what's up, this? What's up, man? What's up, my dog, man? He, he, he's talking about the voice go up. He said, man, what's up, man? Man, yeah, man, I, I'll get my, my hoop clothes on, man. I'll meet you at the basketball court. Yeah, man, what's up, man? Good to hear from you. Then he said, later on that same day, you get a call, and it's like some woman named Lisa. <laughs> he said, your voice is like, hey, what's up, Lisa? How you doing? How you doing, Lisa? How you been? Last time I saw you, you was looking real good. Yeah. 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 Good to hear from you, Lisa. Yeah. We need to get together. And the whole audience was like laughing. But that's real, though. I mean, here's where my voice generally tends to go up. Here's what I'll give you. This is a quick kind of voice lesson one-on-one. See, there's two ways you can talk in terms of your breathing. You can talk from your throat or you can talk from your chest or more specifically what's known as your diaphragm. See, when you talk from your diaphragm, the reason why your voice usually sounds more deep and more resonant is because you're breathing as you're talking. That's what I'm doing right now. When you talk from your diaphragm, you're breathing, you're allowing your channel from your nose all the way down here to breathe as you're talking. And that's what usually makes a person's voice sound deeper and more resonant. Then the alternative ways some people end up talking, most of the time, usually not intentionally, it's kind of unintentional, is they talk from their throat. When you talk from your throat, what you're basically essentially doing, you're, you're for the most part cutting off your air supply. You're cutting off your air supply. And it makes your voice go up like this. Man, the dudes are tripping right now. I'm talking from my throat. Man, fuck them dudes, man. They tripping, man. I'm talking from my throat right now. And that's why my voice is so high. <laughs> yeah, when you talk from your throat, your voice is going to sound more stressed and in most cases more high-pitched. It's more stressed and more high pitch. The key is to always try to consciously teach yourself to talk while you're breathing. This is one of the things I actually do in, um, when I do my one-on-one face-to-face coaching. I help guys talk better, basically. <laughs> it's a simple way of putting it. I help guys use their voice better, Vo- what I call voice regulation. Voice regulation. But anyway, I've gotten that comment before. When I used to be on Blog Talk Radio, a lot of women used to write me, I had this one particular, she was a Latina, because that was her her specialty. That was like her career. She did something to do with helping people with their voice, like a speech, th- a speech therapist or something like that. And she would always say to me, she would say, Alan, your last episode of Blog Talk Radio, you had your 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 throat voice instead of your diaphragm voice. And she would always basically make the point. She said, I'm going to tell you, honestly, take it for what it's worth. But as a woman listening to you, we're, we're far more receptive to when you speak from the diaphragm than when you speak from the throat. When you speak from the throat, that's almost sometimes like scratching nails on a chalkboard. But anyway, I got that feedback from a woman last night. Now, um... 
I had a guy I was talking about in my last video. Collaborations in brand in, in conjunction with brand marketing. And um Oh, I think I mentioned this. See, I didn't, when I was talking about, about not finishing my thought, I had started talking about this early in this live stream, and then I got distracted with something else. But yeah, a lot of guys said they were really appreciative of, of number one, of me talking about that, because they said they 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 didn't really know the, the ins and outs of brand marketing. And secondly, I had a few guys that, that when they thought about it, they said everything I said made sense. I was like, yeah, Alan, like I had this one guy, he wrote me, he said, man, until you did that live stream the other day, Alan, he said, man, everything you said made sense. Because he said, admittedly, I was one of those guys who was always trying to urge you to collaborate with this dating coach and that dating coach and this PUA and that PUA and just other related self-help gurus. But he said, man, when you broke down the brand conflation, the concept of brand conflation and brand confusion. He said, oh man, he said, that made me told, he said, now I'm on your side. He said, now I totally understand why you like to be more of a, a lone wolf. Because he said, like you said, he said, if McDonald's had a YouTube channel and Burger King had a YouTube channel and Wendy's had a, a, a YouTube channel and five guys had a YouTube channel, they're not going to be doing no live streams together. They're not going to be doing no live streams together and collaborating. Well, I mean, what benefit would that be to each of those burger joints for them to do a collaboration like that, where you had the CEO of McDonald's, the CEO of Burger King, the CEO of Wendy's, and the CEO of Five Guys all on a, a live stream together. Now, he said, I could see if there was a panel discussion and they were talking about, you know, the future of the burger industry. I could see all four of those CEOs being a panelist, which is a good analogy on his, this guy's part. But he said, as far as some kind of ongoing collaboration, he said, that wouldn't make no sense. And that's what, I, that's, what, that's what I've been saying for years, man, and more specifically in my very last live stream, man. I mean, again, if other dating coaches and PUAs and other similar related self-help groups want to do that, more power to them. If they, feel, if they genuinely feel like it's beneficial to them and their business objectives and financial objectives, I'd say more power to them. But... To reiterate once again, I'm not going to rehash everything I talked about in my last live stream, but I will say this, man. Here's my thing, man. Number one, I'm not going to collaborate with anybody, particularly an ongoing. Like I've mentioned, I've collaborated with a few people like one time, two times, at most maybe three times. I've done that before. But I've only had really two ongoing collaborations with another dating coach. Again, the longest was Sasha Day Game. I collaborated with him starting with September of 2010 all the way up to January of 2015. And then there was a black dating coach that uh, I collaborated with between roughly October of 2006 and late April, early May of 2007. But here's my thing. If somebody comes to me with a proposed collaboration, First thing I want to know is how is it going to help me grow my channel? Am I going to get, is it going to result in me significantly increasing my YouTube subscribers and or my Patreon subscribers? If the answer is no, that's not a good collaboration for me. If the collaboration is not going to result in me significantly improving my number of YouTube subscribers and or Patreon subscribers, that's not a good collaboration for me. Number two and this is what I really emphasized in the last live stream. Why would I want to collaborate with somebody who's marketing themselves as basically having the same area of expertise as me? <laughs> I'm just going to say, I don't know any other way to say it, man. That's stupid. I mean, seriously, that's, that's literally stupid. Again, here's my number one. I cover a lot of things with my dating coaching, but if I had to narrow down to four things 
here would be the four things I, I, I emphasize is anything to do with direct verbal game, verbally bold, upfront, straightforwardly honest, direct verbal game. So verbal communication, direct verbal communication. Number two is verbal seduction along with erotic dirty talk, basically improving your mouthpiece. And fourth, help a man quickly identify women who are trying to employ manipulative head games so that you won't waste your time and money with a manipulative time waster. That's my main areas. I, there might be a few other things I touch on, but those are my main areas. I'm not going to collaborate with another coach who, who emphasizes those same areas because that leads to brand conflation. And anyway, a lot of guys wrote me after my last live stream and said, damn, the way you broke that down, now, I, but in so many words, almost every guy who wrote me said, after listening to your live stream, now I totally understand why you're reluctant to, to do regular or semi-regular collaborations with other dating coaches. Because now I understand why you feel like it wouldn't be beneficial to you. Yeah, man. Again, I'm willing to collaborate with somebody who has a totally different area of expertise than I do. If, if, if there's another dating coach that say he's strong in the area, like one thing that PBAs talk about and certain dating coaches talk about is the, the concept of looks maxing. Looks basically just simply doing different things to improve your physical appearance and your level of physical attractiveness. Could be like losing weight for fat guys, gaining weight for skinny guys, wearing different quality clothes, cutting their hair better, growing a beard. See, I don't, that's one area I don't really touch on in my dating coach. It's stuff to do with guys' looks. So if I run across another dating coach whose number one area of expertise is looks, and my number one area of expertise is mouthpiece, I would be willing to come together with that guy because we be we would be giving our respective clients you know, expertise in two different areas. But if I'm a mouth, if I'm essentially a mouthpiece coach, why am I going to collaborate with another mouthpiece coach? I, anybody who emphasizes mouthpiece in a similar manner to me, I consider that person a competitor of mine. I ain't not a collaborator. That's a competitor. Just like Wendy's is a competitor to McDonald's. That's a competitor of mine. I mean, I'll, I'll show respect to other dating coaches. I do that quite often. I show certain dating coaches respect. But as far as being able to collaborate, I'm not going to collaborate with a competitor. End of story. I'm not going to collaborate with a competitor. Somebody who's trying to be me. Anyway, I said I didn't want to rehash everything I talked about, but I was just appreciative of the guys who sent me. Yeah, I had at least five, six guys send me feedback related to my discussion about brand conflation, brand confusion, and the ups and downs of uh, collaborations. Now, 21 Convention, I had some guys write me, and they said, Alan, because 21 Convention starts this Thursday. And some guys, I don't know why, but at least a few guys seem to be under the impression that me and Anthony Johnson had a falling out. Some guys wrote me, they said, hey, Alan, man, did Anthony Johnson ban you from the 21 convention? Because I know you haven't spoken there um, since 2018. Whereas I see other guys, they kind of repeatedly, they speak there almost like every year. And they said, no, me and Anthony Johnson are real cool. I mentioned him in a, in a previous live stream. Uh, where is he? Here he is. This is Anthony Johnson. Because as you know, I don't mind talking about it because it's already out there in the general public, so it's not like I'm telling something that's not out, already out there. Anthony Johnson has fallen out with a few of his former speakers. Um, most notably in the last, say, two to three years, him and Rolo Tomasi used to be like that. Anthony Johnson and Rolo Tomasi used to be like that. They're no longer cool. Matter of fact, they, they pretty much hate each other now. At least definitely from Anthony's end. Anthony can't stand Rolo Tomasi now. Can't stand him. And similarly, um, 
Anthony Johnson and Donovan Sharp used to be pretty cool. Donovan Sharp was a speaker at like two, three, maybe as many as four 21 conventions. And then they had a falling out. So just in the last 48 hours or so, I've had guys ask me, they said, Alan, I noticed you haven't spoken. You haven't spoken at the 21 convention since 2018. By chance, did you have a falling out? Well, then, no, me and Anthony are cool, man. I don't agree with everything he says. He says some things that, honestly, I don't particularly agree with. And I'm sure I'll probably say some things that he doesn't 100% agree with, particularly as it relates to a lot of his political views. Um, But Anthony Johnson has always shown me the highest and utmost degree of, of respect, love, kudos, and respect. And I return that love, kudos, and respect to him. Matter of fact, he sent out an email. You know, I'm always tooting my horn as one of the pioneers of the worldwide manosphere. He sent out an email, a mass email, not too long ago, where that's what he did. Anthony Johnson, he included my name. Man, I'm hearing sirens. I hope nobody's shooting. <laughs> nobody shot anyone. Um... Yeah, he sent this this mass email, and there was a part in the email where he said, I think there's a lot of pioneers, early pioneers of the worldwide manosphere that to this day, they don't get their proper level of credit and just do. And he, he named about six or seven guys, and my name was one of them. I think I was the only black name on there. I think I was the only black name. All the other guys were Caucasian. Now, I was the only black name. He said, Alan Roger Curry. He said, Alan Roger Curry is one of the early pioneers of the worldwide manosphere, but to this day, he doesn't get his full props. I say that only like every week. <laughs> I say that only like every fucking week of every fucking month of every fucking year. Like, I hear some guys, mainly in the black manosphere, to a far less extent in the worldwide manosphere, they'll say dating coaches and PUAs shouldn't be a part of the manosphere. Those guys shouldn't be a part of the manosphere. We should ex exclude all dating coaches and PUAs from the manosphere. Motherfucker, it was dating coaches and PUAs who started the fucking manosphere. Drops Mike. Drops Mike. I can't say that about the black manosphere, but definitely the worldwide manosphere was started primarily, if not exclusively, by dating coaches and PUAs. There wouldn't be no worldwide manosphere if it wasn't for dating coaches and PUAs. There wouldn't be no worldwide manosphere. Now, the black manosphere was mainly started by guys who wanted more of a public conversation about the flaws and weaknesses of black women's behavior. So black manosphere is different in that regard. The black manosphere was mainly began, it mainly began by guys who wanted more of a public conversation about the flaws and weaknesses of black women's behavior. So I can't say that uh, the black manosphere was started by dating coaches and PUAs. It was not. So I, I guess you could say I have to understand why some people who are part of black manosphere feel like dating coaches shouldn't be a part of it. Because dating, but the worldwide manosphere was started by dating coaches and PUAs. That's who, who got the ball rolling of what we now call the worldwide manosphere. And I was one of those guys. I was one of those guys. Oh, him a dude. I see uh I see simply deep 1985. You know my man right here, Lil Rock. Yo. Hey man, what'd you think about that exciting Tennessee Titans and Buffalo Bills game last night? Yo. <laughs> what'd you think about Aaron Rodgers? Talking shit to my Chicago Bears, man. What'd you think about that, Lil Rock? You. 
That's my dude, man. Little Rock 2517. Yo. <laughs> ah, man. Um, okay, let me get to my uh my main topic. You know what this is similar to going back to the guys who tease me about. Like, well, not too many people. It's just mainly this one guy teased me about my last live stream. He said, you took a long time to get to your main topic. He said, you spent all this time on all these greetings and shout outs and digressions and rambles. And, uh, well, you know, my nickname, speaking of ramble. That's my alter ego, Rambo. Similar to Stallone's Rambo, that's my alter ego. Whenever I go on an angry rant, which I did in my very last live stream, I tend to nickname my alter ego, Rambo. Um, okay, now, this is kind of going to be pick up you can almost say where my last live stream left off. The, oh, I was going to say, before I get to that, I was going to say, you know what it's like if you're a black person, if you ever been to a Baptist church, Pentecostal church, some other similar church, what do they usually do? <laughs> what are they usually doing that two, three, sometimes four hour service? What do they do? They start off with greetings and music, shout outs and music, church related announcements and music. What else do they do at the Baptist and Pentecostal church? There's a lot of things that lead up to the, to the preacher's sermon. Like, I, I I was I've been a part of like four different denominations of Christianity in my life. I mainly grew up in a Lutheran church. Lutheran is kind of like a first cousin to Catholicism, the Catholic Church. And while I just mentioned the Catholic Church, hey, for a lot of you fellas who say, hey man, it's too many slutty women out here. These women just fucking whoever they want to. You know what you need to become? You need to become a Catholic. The Catholic Church, which is might be the most notorious denomination of all the Christian denominations, Catholic Church, they don't they believe that all women should be virgins until they're married. They believe all women should maintain their virginity until they're married. They believe the man should be the definite leader of the household. And they believe, um, they don't believe in birth control. So they believe in having as many kids as, as you possibly can. They don't, they don't believe in like the birth control pill or even condoms. And finally, they believe the only time, they don't believe in no fault divorce. They believe the only time that divorce should happen is if on the man's end, if your wife cheated on you, that's valid grounds for divorce, regularly cheated, not just one or two times, but regularly cheating on you, grounds for divorce. And on the female end, if the man is cheating or he's beating your ass, cheating or he's beating your ass, that's the only legitimate grounds in the Catholic Church. They make it hard as hell for you to get divorced. So a lot of people who who want to go back to how things were before the 1960s, you need to join the Catholic Church. That's my little <laughs> public service announcement. You need to join the Catholic Church, man.
I've been a part of Lutheran. I've gone to a Baptist church, if only briefly. I was a member of a, a Pentecostal church when I was in college. And I was a part of basically what was called a non-denominational church when I lived in Los Angeles. That's the last time I was part of organized religion was for a brief period when I lived in Los Angeles. Since then, I don't I don't get down with organized religion. I do consider myself a spiritual person, but I'm not down with organized religion. Um, Paul says, did you know that St. Augustine, who was a Catholic saint, was anti-woman and anti-sex? That's where the sexual prudery evolved from. I, I, I either didn't know that or I knew that and forgot that. One of the two. Thank you for sharing that, Paul, one of my other trusted moderators. Um, oh, I was saying that. Lost my train of thought momentarily. I do that. I'm 58. Give me a break. Give me a break. So, uh, yeah, but I was saying in terms of the format of my show, like, again, this guy criticized my very last live stream. He said, I spent too much time doing greetings and shout outs and other digressions and irrelevant rambles. And then I got to the main topic in the last, you know, 25, 30 minutes. I was making a lighthearted analogy. That's what churches do, particularly black churches. They have all the build up. Then the minister comes and does his sermon for about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, hour, sometimes every now in the Pentecostal church, it probably lasts over an hour. And then they make a call for you to be baptized in the name of Jesus. For you to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they wrap up the service with fellowship. So I saved my sermon for the end. I'm going to pick up in the, in the, uh, from the end. Now, the main point of my last live stream, of my main topic was a lot of people confuse what ca basically casual sex with polyamory. And since a lot of guys do that, I want to talk about some of the differences, if, if you saw my title, between there's only really about three or four types of sexual relationships you can have with a member of the opposite sex. Casual sex, short-term or long-term polyamory, Um, long-term monogamous relationship that's not that's outside the context of marriage, and then of course, uh, long-term monogamous sex that's within the context of marriage, and also polyamory can be within the context of marriage. Okay, you got that? And I just want to talk about so many the ins and outs of each one and the pros and cons of each one so that you won't be confused. Again, I'll start where I left off in my last live stream. Again, at the risk of somewhat generalizing, young people, I think, do this more than, old, than people say my age. Older people do. I noticed from talking to a lot of younger guys and even a few younger women, but definitely younger guys, they tend to confuse and conflate casual sex with short-term or long-term polyamory. Those two are not the same thing. Okay? So this first part is probably going to sound like a am repeating and rehashing what I talked about at the end of the very last live stream. And to a certain extent, it will be. But I'm going to take it a few steps further. So, yeah, let's start with casual sex. As, I, as you saw the title... Of my last live stream, man, there's no such thing as meaningful casual sex. There's no such thing as meaningful casual sex. The whole purpose of casual sex is for it to be meaningless, emotionally meaningless sex. That's what casual sex is, is emotionally meaningless sex. So my criticism on my last live stream was, 
I've heard a, a number of guys, mainly from the category of my haters and critics, who will say, well, one of the things I don't like about Alan Roger Curry's Mo One approach is that he doesn't take time to build rapport with women, and he doesn't take time to create an emotional connection or emotional bond with women prior to having casual sex with them. Yeah, you damn right I don't, because that's stupid. Only an idiot would do that. <laughs> Only an idiot would do that. You ever heard the short term for ox oxymoronic behavior is simply called a moron. You don't hear that too much these days. When I young people, sometimes they get frustrated by something. You say, they say damn, you, you're such a moron. You're such a moron. That would be like called, similar to being called like an idiot. You're a moron. And moron was a term that was short for you're exhibiting oxymoronic behavior. Now, I'm, I'm certain that 99% of people in the chat room, probably 99.9% .9 know what an oxymoron is. But I always like to, you know, give the gist of a term. I don't like to assume that everybody knows. What is an oxymoron? Oxymoron is anytime you put two words together or two concepts together that are in direct contradiction to each other. Like, hey, my friend James is selfishly generous. <laughs> that, that's an oxymoronic statement. I got a, a, a friend named Brenda who's a meat-eating vegan. That's, that's oxymoronic. <laughs> you can't be a meat-eating vegan. You can't be a meat-eating vegan. Because <laughs> if you eat meat, that, def that defeats the whole purpose of being a fucking vegan. You can't be a sexually active monk. <laughs> a sexually active monk. If you're a monk, that means you're abstaining from sex. So you can't be a promiscuous monk. That would be an oxymoronic statement. And going back to casual sex, man, if you're trying to incorporate emotions into casual sex, then it's not casual sex. It's not casual sex. See, I'm talking about the throat. You see, did you see that? What I'm talking about? And 99% of the time my voice goes up, that means I'm talking from the throat. Which means I'm basically choking the air supply while I'm talking. So like right now, I'm talking from my diaphragm. Anytime my voice sounds deep and resonant, that means I'm talking from my diaphragm. Because I'm allowing myself to breathe while I'm talking. But see, here's the thing. Here's two times I tend to talk from the throat. Is when I'm either angry, irritated, or frustrated about something. I tend to have a bad habit of talking from the throat. Secondly, is when I'm overexcited to talk about something and I, I'm trying to get too many words out at one time. That's the two main times I tend to talk from the throat. When I'm angry, irritated, frustrated, or when I'm overexcited and too overanxious to get all of what I want to get out, out. Just on a side note. But... But I understand why guys are saying that the whole bill rapport and emotion. I understand where that's coming from. It's, under, it's coming from a place of being, in a nutshell, emotionally manipulative. See, <laughs> casual sex wasn't designed for all men. And that's what frustrates a lot of men. If I'm just putting it real simply and real bluntly. All men weren't cut out to engage in casual sex with a bunch of women. Definitely for free. Now, if you're going to include tricking and whining and dining, maybe. But for free, no. That's that's the whole basis of the eighty, what's known as the 80-20 rule theory. Some of you are familiar with that. Some maybe not. I first read about that when I was a college student back in 1985. I think it was either GQ magazine or Esquire magazine, where there was a psychologist that basically wrote this article where he said, and I'm going to be paraphrasing and oversimplifying it, but what he basically said, he said there's only really about 20% of single heterosexual men that will be able to have sex with women 
without promising some type of long-term monogamous commitment, without spending a lot of time with that woman in a in basically a platonic manner or what I call a non-sexual manner, or without spending a lot of money on that woman. He said there's only about 20% of men that will be able to basically that will be able to have sex, casual sex with women for free. In other words, tricking is not included. Prostitutes, call girls, escorts, not included. Just having sex with women just based on your looks, your personality, your mouthpiece. He said there's only one really, this was in 1985, this guy said that. He said there's only gonna be roughly about 20% of men that are going to have it like that. He said every other guy in society who wants to have sex with women, they ain't going to have to promise them some type of long-term commitment. They're going to have to spend money on those women, buy them gifts, pay for their living expenses, basically be some kind of like trick or sugar daddy. Or he says some guys are going to get so angry and frustrated that they're going to resort to rape. That's the basis for the 80, what's known as the 80-20 rule theory. A lot of guys always drop off the word theory. They'll just say the 80-20 rule, the 80-20 rule, the 80-20 rule. No, it's actually called the 80-20 rule theory, meaning that what he was saying by his own admission, he said it had never been like actually scientifically proven to be true. Definitely the percentage. He he basically in so many words said the real percentage could be higher than 20%. It could be 25 or 30%, or it could be lower. It could be as low as 10 or 15%. So 20% was kind of like an arbitrary number on his part. It that that percentage was not scientifically proven, the exact percentage of 20%. But, um, and that's the basis. That's what led to the basis of me, as I talked about on the last live stream, and a lot of guys gave me credit for, I was talking about guys giving me credit for, I was the one first guy in the manosphere to talk about alpha males and beta males. I don't want to totally rehash that, but yeah, like I had a guy right in my comment section, my last live stream. He said, Alan, I remember, he said, I've been around for a while. He said, Alan, when I first came in into the manosphere, which was about, I think he said about 2003, 2004, 2005, he said nobody was using beta male. The main term for beta males was AFC. And I remember that. Average sexually frustrated chump. Average sexually frustrated chump. They would simply call that an AFC. That was probably the most popular PUA term for what now everybody calls a beta male. Where did I get inspired to use alpha male, beta male? I've, I've mentioned it before, but I'll quickly mention it again. In the early 90s, I was watching a special on animal kingdoms and mating rituals. Animal kingdoms and mating rituals. And it touched on various animal species of animals and some of their more interesting mating rituals. Like, there's some animals that if they want to mate with the same female member, they fight to the death. They literally fight to the death. Like, to put it in human terms, let's say you had Joseph who had a crush on, on, on Linda. And you had another guy named David who had a crush on Linda. And both of them wanted Linda as their wife and mother to their children. Imagine if Joseph and David said, okay. And, you know, some people used to do this in, in, in Europe, the infamous sword fights. Let's say they pulled out a sword and said, whoever wins, whoever is the last man standing gets to marry Linda. Loser, death. That's how some animal kingdoms operate, man. If two alpha males want the same female member, they fight to the death. They don't just fight like to see who lands the most punches, so to speak. They fight to the death. 
And I found that interesting. But without getting too long into that animal special, where the term alpha male, beta male, they say, yeah, in a lot of animal kingdoms, you have what's known as the alpha males and the beta males. And they basically said, a beta male is a guy in worst case scenario that goes his whole life without ever having sex and reproducing himself. There's some human males that, that have experienced that, sadly. Yeah, that's what they say on this page. They say, in worst case scenario, a beta male of a species is some of the men they just not strong enough, smart enough to compete with the alphas. They don't have the same level of courage. And they go their whole existence without ever having sex or reproducing themselves. In best case scenario, it said the beta males only get to have sex with the female members that the alpha males don't want or have already fucked. They didn't actually say the words, I've already fucked. But in so many words, that's what they said. They said, best case scenario, beta male is a guy that either only gets to have sex. I'll put it in human terms. Let's say there's a group of guys that were either only able to have sex with women that were unattractive and significantly overweight or if the women were attractive, they were only able to have sex with attractive women that an alpha male fuck first. That an alpha male fuck first. And so listening to that animal special, that's what I said, oh shit. Ha! I'm gonna apply that to human dating. I said, I'm gonna apply that to human dating. That was fast. I, I think I watched that special like 1991, 1992, 1993. And then when I start writing my first drafts of Mo One, I start using the terms alpha male and beta male. And again, I was the first guy to use that. Anybody else was using other terms. But yeah, watching that special, man. Now going back to casual sex. My main point when I started talking about casual sex again was that. Not all guys were really cut out to be engaging in casuals. Definitely for free. Definitely for free. Now, tricking, when you have the availability of street prostitutes, professional call girls, upscale erotic escorts, and you can just, as they call it, pay for play. Pay for play, that makes it available to any man, regardless of how he looks. Um, he could have absolutely no personal charisma or mouthpiece. He could be lacking masculinity. But as long as he got the right amount of money, he could get some pussy if he pays for it. If, if you remember, I haven't talked about it in a while, but on my blog to radio show, I used to always talk about it. There was this woman I used to be friends with on Facebook. She was a real popular blogger. And she was, she started off being bisexual and transitioned into being more of a lesbian. I know a lot of women in that category, particularly when I lived in Los Angeles. She was a bisexual who had transitioned into being more of a lesbian. I never, ever forget, she wrote this post, man, that I'm sure bruised a lot of male egos and hurt a lot of men's feelings. And I'm going to be somewhat paraphrasing. This is one of the exact words because it's so long ago when she posted it. But here's what she essentially said. She said, and using my terms, alpha male and beta male, she used alpha and beta. She said, a lot of you beta males are lucky. A lot of you beta males are lucky that, there's, that you have cash and material possessions as a tool to help you get sex. Because she said, based on my conversations with the many girlfriends I had, she said, if you took the notion of being wealthy away and the notion of owning expensive material possessions and basically being able to help women with their lifestyle, with their living expenses, she said, most of you beta males wouldn't get no pussy. 
She said that boldly and emphatically. She said most of you beta males wouldn't get no pussy. She said the only guys on earth that would be fucking on a regular basis would be the alpha males of the world. She said you beta males wouldn't get no pussy. She said money and material possessions is you all's saving grace. And I was like, damn. I ain't gonna lie, I kind of was like, damn. I mean, I like to be outspoken and be blunt and truthful, but damn. I was like, damn. That was like just almost like a heartless post. This was bad. I mean, she she posted this. It was somewhere in between. I got on Facebook in 2008, so it couldn't have been any earlier than 2008. I think it was about 2009, 2010, at the latest 2011 when she posted that. Because it was after I got on Facebook, but it was before I wrote my book, Who Said Again, which was in December 2011. So yeah, it was before, it was, yeah, somewhere in there. But yeah, man, that's what she said, man. I was like, ouch. But can anybody say she was 100% lying? Which brings me to the point. See, this is why a lot of guys like to lie to women and mislead women, and emotionally manipulate women. Because they know they're really not casual sex material in the eyes of most women that they meet. They're not. So they try to trick women into having casual sex with them by making those women believe that they want to be that woman's next long-term boyfriend or future husband. Again, some guys turn to either tricking, whining, and dining, or a combination of both. On a quick side note, I always have to point this out. A lot of guys conflate whining and dining and tricking. Those two are not the same. Tricking is illegal. <laughs> in real simple terms. Tricking is illegal in just about the vast majority of cities and countries in the world. Tricking is illegal. That's solicitation for prostitution. That's different from whining and dining. I don't want to rehash my pre... I've done probably... At this year alone, in 2021, I've probably done at least three videos related to tricking versus whining and dining. But I hear a lot of guys, they still confuse and conflate those two. Those are not the same thing, man. Whining and dining, there's nothing illegal about whining and dining. In real simple terms, here's the difference. Tricking, anytime you go up to a woman and you offer her money or materialistic gifts and possessions in direct exchange, direct keyword, in direct exchange for a sexual companionship, that means you're tricking. And again, in most cities, in most countries around the world, that's illegal. You could actually get fined and or go to jail for soliciting a woman for her sexual companionship directly. Can't do that. Unless you're living in a city where it's legal. Can't do that. You can't just... Walk down the street and say to a woman, hey, I'll give you $75 if you suck my dick. That woman can report you to the police. You, Your ass will either be at minimum fined or you will be jailed. That's not opinion. That's fact. You cannot just go up to a woman and say, hey, I'll give you $250 if you let me fuck you for the next three hours. That's solicitation for prostitution. That's tricking. Can't do that in most cities and most countries. Can't do that. You'll either be fined, jailed, or both. As the college basketball <laughs> commentator, Greg Anthony, he knows what I'm talking about. You can't do that. You can't just walk up to a woman and offer her cash or material possessions in exchange for her sexual companionship directly. Whining and dining is when you spend money on a woman or you might give a woman materialistic gifts with the hopeful or confident expectation that she's going to reward you with sex. But you can't directly ask for it. So example of wine and nine, the most easiest example of wine and nine would be like, if you took a woman out to dinner three Fridays in a row to a five-star restaurant, and you just hopefully and confidently expected that she was going to reward you with her sexual companionship to show her gratitude for you taking her out to dinner three Fridays in a row. That's whining and dining. 
But at no point can you say, hey, if I take you out to dinner three weeks in a row, you got to give me some pussy. Once you do that, you're in the zone of tricking and there's some legality. There's a, a legal risk in that. Tricking, unless you live in a city where it's legal, there's always a legal risk to tricking. There's no legal risk to whining and dining. But anytime you ask a woman directly for sex and you offer to pay for it, there's a legal risk involved. That's what separates mall one from chicken. See, I can go up to a woman and say, hey, I want to fuck you. There ain't no legal risk to that because I ain't offering her no money or no material possessions. If I just tell a woman, hey, I think you're attractive, I want to fuck you, that's legal. At least here in the United States it is. That's legal. But if I was to say, hey, I want to fuck you and I'm willing to pay you $150 for it, that's legally risky. That's tricking. That's solicitation for prostitution. Get it, get it good. Okay, so casual sex wasn't meant for everybody. It wasn't meant for every man. It wasn't meant for every woman. Some women are not cut out. Just the same way I said some men are not really cut out to be casual sex material, mainly because they might not have the physical appearance that the women want. They might not have the confidence and masculine sex appeal that the women want. They might not have the persuasively charming, charismatic, charismatic, seductive mouthpiece that the woman wants. So they're not cut out. With women, if a woman's too emotional and catches feelings real quick, she's not cut out for casual sex. She should never engage in it. No woman who catches feelings real quick just because a guy gives them some good dick should never indulge in casual sex because they're going to have their heart broken over and over and over and over and over again. Over and over and over and over and over again. In defense of a lot of women, I'll say the women I've interacted with in my life, most of the women I've interacted with in my life, they knew if they were cut out for casual sex or not. Like I've had female acquaintances of mine that have said, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm never going to indulge in casual sex because I, I I catch feelings in one way or another, they would basically say, I catch feelings to guys too quick. But then there's other women. As I talked about in my last live stream and talked about it on a number of my videos. There's some women that they have, they know how to delineate men the same way men know how to delineate women. Like, again, the women who contributed to my formation of my mall one approach when I was in college. These three AKAs. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. Ski Yo. Um, these women broke it down to me back when I was in college. It was like, shoot. I know what guys I just want to fuck to be fucking. That's what these babies, these three women said. They said, we know the guys we just want to fuck to be fucking. Before I move on to polyamory, here's how I sum up casual sex. Casual sex is when you have a high interest in someone's sexual companionship, but a less than average interest in their non-sexual companionship. That's the number one time that casual sex is most ideal for both the man involved and the woman involved. Is when you meet someone and your interest is high, the appeal of their sexual companionship is very, very high, but the appeal of their non-sexual companionship is very, very low. Pretty much every woman I've had casual sex with in my life were women that I found physically attractive and sexually appealing but in terms of spending a significant amount of time with them non-sexually, I had no interest, like literally none, Z pretty much zero. I had no interest in spending time with them non-sexually. And I've had women treat me that way. I've talked about it on my videos. It ain't just one-sided. I've had a lot of women, honestly, who looked at me that way, mainly when I was in my 20s and 30s. When I was in my 20s, 30s, I, I could tell you quite a few women I had sex with would basically tell me, Alan, I like you as a fuck buddy, but I would never, ever want you to be my boyfriend or husband, ever. <laughs> they would, someone would be very blunt and to the point about that. They would say, Alan, I want you to be my fuck buddy, but I would never consider you as a boyfriend or husband 
There was usually three reasons. Anytime a woman told me that, I usually came out one or more of these three reasons. The only reason usually had to do with my lack of career success and financial success. That was usually number one. Women would say, uh, you too, in, in real blunt turn, they basically say, you're too broke to be boyfriend material, husband material. You don't make enough money. Number two thing was they would usually say, you too kinky and promiscuous. You have too many, too much promiscuous tendencies. And I wouldn't trust you to be faithful. And the third thing was they would say I was too, too dominant and or too uncompromising. Too dominant and or too uncompromising. Those are the three main reasons I get from women when women would say, you fuck buddy material, but you're not boyfriend or husband material. Just like a man. Like, and I would, so it went both ways because I did that with a lot of women. I would say, you fuck buddy material, but I would never date you. I told some women that, a lot of women that straight up. I would tell women, I'd say, I would never, ever, you, you would never qualify to be my girlfriend or wife, ever. <laughs> and I heard a lot of women's feelings, but I told a lot of women that straight, look at them dead in their eyes, I told them that. I said, you would, you would never qualify to be a long-term girlfriend of mine or a wife of mine. My wife is actually, well, obviously, she's the only woman I went as far as to marry. And even considering for marriage, she's probably one of only three or four women in my entire life that I even, like, considered marrying. My current wife is the only woman I proposed to. She's the only woman I proposed to. And she's one of only three or four women that even entertain the idea of marrying. Now let's move up to polyamory. Which is what a lot of, again, what a lot of young guys tend to almost confuse and conflate with casual sex. Polyamory, the best way to think of polyamory would be Polyamory is casual sex with emotions involved. That's the simplest way to describe polyamory. Oh, let me rewind for a second, because I said in my title of this live stream, I said I was going to talk about the pros and cons of each type of sexual relationship. So let's go back to casual sex. What are the pros of casual sex and what are the cons of casual sex? The benefits and detriments. Casual sex is beneficial if you're a guy that just really you know, don't like being around women non-sexually, period. End of story. That's when casual sex is beneficial. When I And I, for a large, certain portions of my life, that was me. That was Alan Roger Curry. There was a lot of portions of my life where I really didn't want to be around women non-sexually. I just wanted to be around them when I was horny and wanted to fuck. When I was horny and I wanted to fuck. Non-sexually, I didn't want to be around them. I tended to, to find most women I met in my life either non-sexually, I found them either to be boring or irritating. Boring or irritating. My wife is probably the first woman that I've thoroughly enjoyed being with both sexually and non-sexually of any woman I've ever met. Of any woman starting with the, my high school days. She's lit. That's why she got a ring on her finger. <laughs> her reward for being appealing in both areas is her reward for that is she got a ring on her finger. Before my wife, man, most women, I either had much more interest in their sexual companionship than I did their, their non sexual companionship, or in a few cases, it was just the opposite. I, I found them appealing non sexually, but they didn't have the physical appearance or sex appeal. That I wanted. But casual sex benefits you if you just really don't want to be around. And you know, you, 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 you want to keep your options open for fucking multiple different women. And secondly, you just really don't like being around women non sexually at all. That's when casual sex is beneficial. The detriment of casual sex is if you indulge in unprotected sex a percentage of the time, you're going to run the risk 
of either contracting an STD or STI, sexually transmitted disease, a sexually transmitted infection. I took a lot of risks, man, when I was younger with casual sex. I'm a knock on wood. God helped me. He protected me to be spiritual. Because truthfully, with all the casual sex I had that was unprotected, I should have had at least one STD. I'm, you know, I've never had an STD ever. Like in my entire sexually active life, I've never had one STD or STI ever. And that's why I knocked on wood. Never, ever, ever. And most people close to me feel like that's amazing. Mainly my brother. He, he my brother feels like it's amazing that I never had casual sex. I mean, never caught an STD. Because I want to say, if I had to give a rough estimate, of all the casual sex I had in my life, I would say probably roughly 35 to 40% of it was unprotected casual sex. Was unprotected casual sex. Yep, I would say roughly 35 to 40% of all my casual sex in my life was unprotected casual sex. Next to SCDs and SCIs, casual sex can, if again, if you're doing unprotected, you can have unexpected pregnancy. That's why you got men with multiple baby mamas from a one night stand or a weekend fling. Women who have multiple baby daddies from that came from a one night stand or a weekend fling or some other variation of casual sex. That's one thing that always scared the shit out of me. I never, and I say this with all due respect to people who are the product of a casual sex relationship or who have children that were the product of a casual sex. I'm not passing judgment around, but I'm speaking for myself. I never, ever, ever wanted to have a baby with a woman that I just looked at as a fuck buddy. If one of my fuck buddies would have came to me and said that they were pregnant, man, my heart would have went to my foot. I ne that's one of the biggest things when it relates to having children. I never, ever, ever wanted to have a child with a woman that I knew was nothing more than a fuck buddy. But I, the, the risky thing I did is I put myself in a position to have that happen. By having unprotected sex. I put myself in a position where I could, conceivably, I could be in a situation where I got like, uh, Six kids by four different women. I could have easily been that guy who had six kids by four different women. Or at least four kids by four different women. Now let's move to polyamory. So that's the pros and cons of casual sex. Polyamory is kind of like the midway point between a long-term, strictly monogamous relationship and short-term casual sex. It's similar to casual sex in the sense that it's non-monogamous. That's where it shares a similarity with casual sex. Polyamorous sex is when you do not want a strictly monogamous-oriented relationship. You don't want an indefinite Monogamous, faithfully monogamous commitment to one person. It's similar to a, a long term, a more long term, strictly monogamous relationship, is that you do open the door for emotions to come into play. And I, I mentioned on a previous live stream that there was a young brother, I won't say his name, but he was doing a live stream. This is about Thing, two weeks ago, where he was generalizing his own generation. He was in his early 30s. And he was saying, he brought my name up. He said, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, he said, I don't think most guys in my age group are into truly casual sex, at least by the way Alan Roger Curry describes it. He said, most women in my age group, they're not down with just fucking a guy without that guy spending some amount of non time with them non-sexually. 
He said, so I'm going to generalize my journey. He said, most guys aren't able to get the type of casual sex in this day and age that Alan Roger Curry was able to get in the 80s and 90s and whatever. That's not true. I don't agree with that. Because I've had, I've had casual sex with young women in the 21st century without spending any time with them non-sexually. So that's how I know that that's not true. I've had casual sex with women younger than me in their 30s. The last woman I had a casual sex relationship with before I met my, my wife, I didn't spend really any time with her non-sexually. Almost zero. We just hooked up to fuck. So I know that ain't true about young women. But that's what this guy was saying. He, he went on to say that most women today, are if, if, if it's going to be non-monogamous, they want it to be more of a friends with benefits than just straight fuck buddies. So dang, man, I'm, I'm kind of, I ain't going to lie now. My feelings kind of hurt. I ain't got not one super chat in like a half hour. Oh, wait, I'm, did I miss this? Sam Puckett says, check out the multi-orgasmic man by Montauk Chia. Okay. And why should I check that out? Give me one good reason. What, what, what like, is in that book? Oh, Ray says, I sent you a cash app. You said cash app, not super. No, I want all of it. I didn't say I didn't want super chats. Shoot, I'll take, I definitely, you know, shoot. That's half the reason I got in the live streaming. To make, as I, I put in one live stream, to make money off of my long windedness. Um, but in addition to super chats, I'll take um, cash app and PayPal. Now, I ain't going to go on one end. I ain't going to go as far as to be one of the guys, one of my chat room guys mentioned, guys who threaten to shut down their live stream if they don't get enough financial contributions. But I will be honest, man. I'm not going to do live stream on a regular basis if it ain't financial, financially beneficial to me. I mean, that's just real fucking talk. If it ain't financially beneficial to me, so far with every live stream it has been. But... Uh, if it ain't financially beneficial to me, I mean, what, what's the point? Like, I told y'all about the lead attorney. Lead attorney, man, I, I'm bringing him up yet yeah, once, once again. This brother, man, he spent an hour and 15 minutes talking about nothing. Just doing greetings and shout outs. He didn't talk about shit of, of substance. And that's not me disparaging him. That's just me telling the truth. For the first hour, hour and 15 minutes of last year, he didn't talk about nothing of substance, yet he cleared over a thousand dollars in super chats i was like holy shit i mean he didn't talk about nothing of profound stuff he didn't start talking about stuff of profound substance until much later in the live stream but at least the first hour or 15 minutes he didn't talk about nothing of substance and yet he cleared over a thousand dollars in super chats And here I am dropping gems of profound knowledge, wisdom, and insight. And so far, I don't know how much I've accumulated so far, but I want to say of all my live streams I've done to this point, this is my least amount of Super Chat. Maybe because I'm, it's early in the day. Oh, okay. See, Ray Arrows, he, he, he feels for me. He said, man, Unc, I'm going to rescue you, man. He gives me $20 British Power fan care. He said, I appreciate that, Ray. I appreciate that. And see, I don't want to become that guy that spends one third to one half of my live stream just say, hey, give me some money, give me some money, give me some money, give me some money. Okay, here's my cash app, here's my PayPal. Give me some money, give me some money. I don't want to be that guy. But at the same time, man, I'm not going to be doing hour and a half, two hours, two hour, half hour live streams and I ain't getting shit or close to nothing. Shit, I can go back to doing pre recorded videos and do that. I can go back to doing pre-recorded videos if I ain't gonna get no super chats.
Now, I said to people, the main way I want people to support me financially, if they don't own them already, is to buy all my books. I said more specifically, my four audiobooks. To buy all four of my audiobooks. That's the, that's the, I would say that, along with becoming a Patreon subscriber, is the two most ways, of my preferred ways of financial support. For people to buy all four of my audiobooks, if not the audiobooks, you know, the ebooks or paperbacks. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just pre-warning you guys. If I continue to do live streams and I see the Super Chat earnings and other various earnings is minimal, I'm going to lose interest, man. I'm going to lose interest, man. I'm going to lose interest, man. Time is money, man. This is my time. Time is money. Have y'all, do y'all know how much I make for like one-on-one coaching? The bare minimum. I make for for one on one coaching is something in the area like five hundred dollars an hour. That's the minimum five hundred dollars an hour. If you ain't paying me at least five hundred dollars an hour, you ain't seeing me in person. You ain't seeing me. <laughs> That's facts. You ain't seeing me. You ain't talking to me. That's real motherfucking talk. I'm five hundred dollars an hour, man. You if you ain't paying me, at, that's the minimum. I charge for my one-on-one face-to-face coaching. If you ain't paying me at least $500 an hour, you ain't talking to me. You ain't even having a two-minute conversation with me. Like, I've had people who follow me say, hey, Alan, man, I heard you coming to LA. Hey, man, can we hang out for drinks? And I'd be like, fuck no. And I know that sounds kind of mean, but I'd be like, hell, hell no. Or, man, Alan, I heard you was coming to Manhattan next month, man. Can we, like, go to a bar and grab some drinks? I'd be like, fuck no. No, I actually don't usually say fuck no. But I don't hang out with people for free. I don't. I really don't. I don't hang out with people. Like people who are potential clients. I don't hang out with people for free. I'm a businessman, man. My time is money. You want to talk to me for an hour? Pay me $500. That's, again, that's my minimum rate. That's my minimum. So anyway, I got to wrap up in a little bit. I'm just going. So he's on polyamory. Polyamory is when you want your 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 sexual relationship with a man or woman to be non-monogamous, but you still want emotions to be involved. You can kind of consider polyamory one step above being just strictly fuck buddies, but one step below being strictly monogamous spouses or partners. There's two basic ways you can have polyamory. You can have it like in a situation where you basically have like, you're a man and you get like three long-term girlfriends at the same time. That would be a form of polyamory. Uh, I appreciate the super chat. Enhanced sexual experience, benefit of organism without the drain of a jacket. Oh, like Tantra. Sounds like Tantra. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like Tantra. Tantra, if most people are familiar with tantric sex, t- you know, I, I never knew this until about, I don't know, about 15 years ago. I used to think for a man, having an ejaculation was the same thing as having an orgasm. Until I did an interview with this woman that was a tantric expert, and she went on to explain to me. She said, no, that's what a lot of men get it confused. She said, when you're a man, your orgasm happens like roughly one, two, or as many as three seconds before you ejaculate. That sensation you feel like pretty much right before you ejaculate, she said, that's your orgasm. Ejaculation, she went on to say, was basically the result of your orgasm. It's not representative of the orgasm itself. That's representative of the result of your orgasm. The orgasm is that that fantastic sensation you feel Roughly one to three seconds before you ejaculate. 
That's your orgasm. And tantric sex centers around right before you feel yourself about to ejaculate, you stop fucking. You don't allow yourself to ejaculate. And it could potentially keep your dick hard for hours. I've done that. And I ain't going to say that's totally enjoyable. That's kind of frustrating. I'm sure a lot of men in my chat room have done I've fucked a woman for roughly minimal, i say at least two and a half, three hours without having not one ejaculatory orgasm. That's real talk. There have been a few times I've fucked a woman for a minimum like two and a half hours with a, like maybe a three minute break here, five minute break there. But overall about two and a half, three hours without having not one eject. My dick would be rock hard, but wasn't able to come. Um, so polyamory. Now, polyamory is real tricky, man. It takes a certain type of person to indulge in polyamory. Like I was saying, one version of polyamory is like if you had three long-term girlfriends at the same time. Another version would be if you had one long-term girlfriend and two additional casual sex lovers or friends with benefits partners. Another version could be you're married, but you have additional lovers that you see. That's polyamory. A lot of men and women can't handle polyamory. Just going to keep it real. A lot of men and women ain't ready for polyamory, man. Ain't ready for polyamory. And it has to do with the, the, the notion of emotions, man. Most men, not all, there's exceptions, of course. Most men are very egotistical, more specifically, egotistically insecure, very jealous, very possessive, very territorial. Which all that to say that most men don't have it in them to share their woman with another male lover. It takes a special type of man to share his wife, fiance, or girlfriend with at least one other male lover. You got to be a super duper egotistically secure motherfucker to do that. There was a guy interviewed on Blog Talk Radio. He wrote this blog back in 2015 about that. It was, it was really a well written blog. I'll never forget. It. I think his name is Raku Sakim. Something like that. It was like an African. Raku Sakim. He wrote this article where he basically said only an egotistically secure alpha male can share their women with another guy without becoming like super duper jealous or, you know, yeah, insanely jealous and, and angry. And he said, if you're basically in so many words, he said, if you're a guy that's a combination of egotistically insecure and, and extremely jealous and territorial, you can't have, you, you should never even think about indulging in a polyamorous relationship. Why do you think most men cheat? What's the easy way out? The, the easy way you can say alternative to polyamory? Cheating. I want most men cheat. That's why a lot of men cheat. Cheaters, basically, the simple difference between cheating and engaging in polyamory, when you cheat, you want the freedom to have more than one sex partner on your end, but you don't want your wife, fiance, or girlfriend to have the freedom to have an additional lover. So you just cheat. Plain and simply, that's when you cheat. That's when most men cheat. Cheaters, in real simple terms, is when a man wants the polyamorous freedom to have two or more lovers on his end, but he does not want his wife, fiance, or long-term girlfriend to have the freedom to take on one or more additional lovers. That's when most guys cheat. See, it's not just men. Women cheat too. That's, that's the basis for women cheating. So it goes both ways. People cheat when they want polyamorous freedom and options, but they don't want their spouse or partner to have that same freedom. And then, of course, if you're a really possessive and territorial guy and a really possessive and ter territorial woman, 
then of course you need to be in a in a strictly monogamous relationship. That's what strictly monogamy is for. The problem is, particularly in modern day society, you got too many people that pretend as though they have a desire for long-term or indefinite strict monogamy when they really don't. And again, that's why you got cheating. That's why you got cheating. I don't respect cheaters, man. Now, I ain't gonna lie, as most people know, when I was younger, yeah, I fucked, I fucked quite a few female cheaters. So some people look at that as me being hypocritical. But just because I fucked women who were cheating on their husbands, fiancés, or long-term boyfriends didn't mean I respected those women. <laughs> Let me make that clear. Just because I fucked them didn't mean I respected them. A lot of them, I used to tell them to their face that they were cheating as no good sluts. I don't respect people who cheat, man. I just don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't. I don't like cheaters on both ends. I don't like men who cheat on their wives, fiancés, or girlfriends. I don't like women who cheat on their husbands, um, fiancés, or boyfriends. Don't like cheaters, man. If you're a cheater and you happen to experience some type of undesirable consequences, repercussions, you deserve all of them. <laughs> I'll just say that. You deserve all of them. If you're a slick, clever motherfucker on a male end, on a woman end, you're able to cheat and pretty much get away with it, more power to you. But in most cases, not all, but in most cases, usually the shit always comes out in the wash. And whatever consequences, repercussions you face, you ain't going to get no empathy or sympathy from me. I think the man, if you, if you know you're not a monogamy oriented person, you need to tell a woman that you're dating. Hey, like I've done, I've done this starting with the age of 22 years old, really technically 21, but I say no, I'm 22. Do you know from the age of 22 to now, I have never promised or guaranteed a woman long-term strict monogamy ever. Not one done. Every woman I've ever been in a long-term relationship I always told them ahead of time that there was going to be at least a chance, at least a 10, 15, 20% chance that I was going to fuck somebody else if the opportunity was presented to me. But I did, what I did promise them, though, I said, I would always let you know. I've never fucked a woman behind her back, starting with the age of 22. Never. I've never fucked a woman. Like, if I was in a relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, I never fucked a woman behind my girlfriend's back. If the times I did fuck somebody other than my girlfriend, I either told them ahead of time or immediately right afterwards. Most of the time, ahead of time. I told the women ahead of time. I said, hey, there's this other woman I met. I'm, I'm thinking about fucking her. I'm probably going to fuck her. See, that's what true players do, man. True players don't, don't sneak behind backs, man, and do that shit. True players, man, they let women know up front, man, that they're going to be fucking other women. And they, their attitude is either you you adhere to my program or you don't. Either you adhere to my program or you don't. Uh oh. Uh oh. Here's your reminder advice session with client. Here's your reminder. Advice session with client. Thank you for that reminder. All right, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I remember that article where I see in my first, I'm in my first poly relationship and want to see if I'll be able to be emotionally secure to let another guy have a size. She hasn't so far, but she knows I have. Okay. Yeah, man. Polyamorous relationships, again, without question, are the trickiest. Because most people, see, what I found, particularly on the male end, 
and even to a certain degree, even on the female end, but definitely on the male end, a lot of guys, they're only interested in what's known as one-sided polyamory, which really technically is not polyamory at all. <laughs> I want you to know. That's not polyamory. Like, for example, I've heard guys say, well, I want to be open and honest with my girlfriend about the fact that I want to fuck other women or that I'm going to be fucking other women, but I don't, I'm not going to give her the freedom at all to fuck other dudes. Then that's not true polyamory then. That's just some kind of one-sided monogamy relationship that you're trying to design, but that ain't, that ain't, that ain't truly a polyamorous relationship. One-sided polyamory is really no polyamory at all. One-sided polyamory is no polyamory at all. Now, I have had a couple of relationships in the past that were like that, where I told a woman I was going to be fucking other women, and I actually gave the woman the freedom to fuck other guys, but she said she didn't want to. She only wanted to have sex with me. So I've had that happen at least twice. Where a woman said, I only want to have sex with you, even though I know you fucking other women. But I didn't force her. See, you should never try to force any woman to be monogamous to you, number one. That's a huge mistake. <laughs> if you didn't know that before this live stream, you know that now. I'm telling you emphatically, that's one of the worst mistakes you could ever make in your fucking life. Is to try to force a woman. When you try to force a woman to be monogamous with you, you're almost asking for her to cheat on you. You're almost asking a woman to cheat on you. All the married women I fucked, their husbands tried to force them to be monogamous. And my dick still ended up in their pussy. Drops Mike. Don't ever try to force a woman to be monogamous. I, I say that in my book, The Beta Male Revolution. That's one thing I say I know I do not believe in. One thing I say in my book, The Beta Male Revolution, I do not believe, I do not believe in obligatory monogamy. In other words, being monogamous to someone because you feel like you're supposed to be monogamous or you have to be. I the only time I believe in monogamy if it's if it's genuine, enthusiastic, and voluntary. Genuine, enthusiastic, and voluntary. Right now, honestly. Since I've been with my wife, I have been monogamous with my wife, and she has with me. Our monogamy is genuine, enthusiastic, and voluntary. It's genuine, enthusiastic, and voluntary. I mean, <laughs> to give some of my personal business, if me and my wife was to cheat on each other, or have, just really have sex with somebody, period, that would be a magic trick. <laughs> that would be somewhat of a magic trick. And I say that because we spend so much time together. Me and my wife and my son, because we all work, me and my wife both work from home. We don't have like a nine to five job. And because of the pandemic, we really don't have all that much of a social life, period. We don't really come into contact with anybody else. Other than when I went to visit her family down south, I mean, me and my wife, since we've been together, we rarely have ever have been apart from each other. We've always been around each other. We're, we're around each other. And I didn't, I'll be honest, man, a few years ago, I didn't think I could do that. I didn't think I could be around a woman, you know, like pretty much in a 24-7 fashion like that. But me and my wife, man, we're around each other, yeah, pretty much 24-7. Because I haven't done any traveling for my one-on-one face-to-face -on -one coaching sessions since I've been with her. Um, which I have lost some money on, but you know. um, yeah, I don't. I mean, yeah, we are me now with my son too. Yeah, it's, it's me, my wife, my, my son. We around each other all the time, like pretty much every day. So that's why I like her. I say it would be a magic trick for either her to cheat on me behind my back or me to cheat on her. I'm not. A, neither one of us are in favor of cheating. But let's just say for argument's sake, if we were to try to cheat, I don't know when that would happen. We go to the grocery store together. <laughs> I mean, my wife is rarely if ever out of my sight. Rarely if ever out of my sight. Thank you for this $5 super chat. Mark, the spark. 
Anyway, I'm going to wrap up here. This was one of my earliest live streams. Normally, I won't be doing live streams this early. The only reason I did one this early was because I have three... I have three uh, consultations back to back to back this afternoon. But I need to try to get a snack in my stomach. Um, so, yeah, I don't know when I'll be back for my next one. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Here, here, here's my last comment. You need to remember that Paul reiterated it. Never force a woman. Um, I'll tell you at least one other dating coach, or I don't know what he calls himself, if he calls himself a dating coach, who believes in that too, is uh, some of y'all might be familiar with a guy who goes by the name Johnny Soporno. You know, Johnny Soporno, you could almost call him the king of polyamory. That dude's the king of polyamory, man. Johnny Soporno? He told me, we because, you know, we've done a few conferences together. He's never had a monogamous relationship ever. What he told me. He's never had a monogamous relationship. All of his relationships were polyamorous in nature. Like, he's, one of his main partners for the last few years is a woman who's a porn star. Imagine being in a long-term relationship with a woman that's a porn star. Now, I know some people have said, oh, that means he's a cook. He's a cook. He's a cook. Because y'all don't know what a cuck is. I ain't going to go on a long thing about that. But just because you share your wife, fiance, I, I did a whole video on this. And I don't want to rehash the whole video. But just because you share your wife, fiance, or long-term girlfriend with another man or allow them to take on an additional, additional lover does not mean you're a cucko. A cucko is someone who's not only involved in a non-monogamous relationship with a woman, but he is submissive to his woman. He's basically his wife's fiance or girlfriend's bitch. That's a true, that's a true definition of cucko, is when you are your wife's bitch, your fiance's bitch, your long-term girlfriend's bitch. You are her beta male bitch boy. You do everything she tells you to do. You follow all of her demands and requests. You are her bit. That's a cuckold. So I just want to make that clear for the upteen time. Just because, like, there are guys who are swingers that are not cuckolds. They are very dominant with their women. Trust me on that. There are guys who are what's known as swingers who are very dominant with their wives, fiancés, or girlfriends, and they just so happen to share them with other men. But that is not a, the synonymous with a cuck. Again, a cucko is when you not only allow your female partner to have sex with other men, but you're subservient about it. You're, you're obedient and submissive and subservient about it. You're her bitch. That's, a, that's the true definition of a cucko. Now, right before I'm going to wrap up, I'm starting to get some super chats. Ain't that so? <laughs> Again, I got Cash App in my description section, PayPal in my description section. Let me see what Cole Steel. $10. It seems to be more natural for the woman to share the man than the man to share the woman. Doesn't having options make the man more attractive? More? No, that's not, that's not true. A lot of men tend to believe that. Tend to believe that. But that's that. No, 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 no. I just talked about Cole Steel. If you were listening, what did I talk about earlier in this very live stream when, about when I was in my 20s and 30s? What did I just talk about? And I've talked about this multiple times. I can think of quite a few women. I'm talking about dozens of women that enjoyed having me as a fuck buddy. But when it came to looking at me as boyfriend material, husband material, they were like, oh, I would never, ever be in a long-term relationship with you. I can't tell you how many women told me that in my life, particularly when I was in my 20s and 30s. I had a lot of women who said, Alan, I would never want you as a boyfriend or husband because you're too kinky and you're too promiscuous. You're too kinky and you're too promiscuous. Women are attracted to guys for casual sex if that guy has a reputation for getting a lot of pussy and being very sexually desirable to other women. Yeah, no doubt about that. But for husbands... I did a whole video on that. I think last year I said it was titled something to the effect of you men may not realize, but women are just as judgmental on men's promiscuity 
as you are on women's premise skin. I don't think it was that long. It was short. But that was the essence of my video. I did a video on last year in 2020 about that. Women, when it comes to marriage and long-term relationships, most women, not all, but most women, they're just as judgmental about a man's promiscuity as men are about women's promiscuity. Trust me. Particularly if you're talking about women from like a middle class, upper middle class type background, shit. Why do you think most women would rather be in a relationship or a marriage with a monogamy-oriented guy, but then have a promiscuous guy on the side like I was for about 40 women? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Women don't want to be married to no fucking promiscuous womanizer. Unless they like a porno star or something. I don't know hardly any women that want to be married to a guy who has prom actively promiscuous tendencies. That's bullshit. Again, for casual sex appeal, a lot of women are drawn to casual sex to guys that they know are fucking multiple women. And they know women, a lot of women want to fuck them. No doubt there. But if you're talking about for long-term relationships and marriage, no. Most women, exceptions aside, most women want a good guy as their boyfriend or husband. Boyfriend, fiance, or husband. They want a guy who has monogamy-oriented sensibilities and wants to raise a family. They don't want to be married to no guy that they know every weekend he out there fucking some other bitch. There's a few women who put up with that shit or don't mind that shit, but the average woman, fuck no. You gotta be out your mind, fuck no. 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 The average woman does not want that in a boyfriend, fiance, or husband. No. They do not. Trust me when I say this. That's why, again, going back to the, the three AKs I talked to in college, that's what they were basically saying. Read my book, No Free Attention. When I briefly talk about these women that I had that conversation with when I was uh, um, these three members of Alpha Kappa Alpha, there's a chapter where I talk about it in my book, No Free Attention. That's what these women basically said. When, as far back, this was like the mid-80s, these women said that. They said, basically, they said there's certain guys we want to fuck just to be fucking. In other words, they, they cool with just having casual sex with. Then they said there's certain guys, other guys we want as we look at as boyfriend material and husband material. And when they were talking about the women, the men that they look at as boyfriend, husband material, the biggest thing they talked about was a guy who's going to be monogamously faithful to them. Who's going to be faithfully monogamous to them. I mean, that was like the number one attribute that they said they looked at in a boyfriend or a husband material guy. is a guy who's going to be faithfully monogamous to them. So to your point, your, your statement, Cole Still, I disagree with that, man. Yeah, again, there's some exceptions here and there with women who are very liberal-minded, free-spirited, open-minded, liber sexually liberated type women who would be cool with that. Women who are involved in like the polyamorous lifestyle would be cool with that. But the average conservative woman in society, no. This is what, this is what the average conservative woman in society wants to do. When it comes to having two or more dicks in her life, she wants to be in a relationship or marriage with the faithful guy. The guy who's going to be faithfully monogamous to her. And then she would have one, two, maybe even as many as three guys on the side that are just giving her some kinky casual dick. Again, that's the role I played for a lot of women between the age of 17 and 37. When I was between roughly 17 and 37, I was a lot of women who were either married, engaged in marriage, or had a boyfriend. I was their designated dick on the side. I was their designated dick on the side. They wanted me for casual sex, but they didn't, they didn't want me as no boyfriend or husband. They didn't want me as no boyfriend or husband. Number one, again, it was usually for these three reasons. Here's the three reasons, again, why most women, the women who didn't want me as a boyfriend or husband told me. Number one, they was like, you don't have no career success or financial success. Number two was, you too kinky and promiscuous. Number three was, you too dominant and uncompromising. So anyway, yeah, man, you got to know women better. Uh... <laughs> See, no, nah, I'm going to wrap up. I got to do a consultation. Matter of fact, I'm late. Having a sex drive with having your cake and eat it too is the problem.
polyamory, yeah, there you go. That's a key statement right there. Polyamory requires both the man and the woman involved to be more one. That's the only really way a polyamorous relationship can work long term is if both the man and the woman involved are essentially mo one in terms of their verbal communication and their, their level of honesty. They got to be mo one, man. Otherwise, I can tell you right now, if you're not mo one with your partner or your spouse, there ain't even no point of you trying to enter into a, a, a polyamorous relationship. You might as well just stick to traditional cheating and take your chances with cheating. Now, there are some people, both men and women, who have been able to get away with cheating. But I tell you this, when you do experience the repercussions and consequences from cheating, y'all know about the friend of my cousins. A woman came to his crib, shot him in the head. Shot him in the fucking head. I've had other guys who cheated on their women, had their tires slashed, their cars vandalized, their houses and apartments vandalized. She, what's that famous woman who her, her boyfriend was cheating on her and she cut off his dick while he was asleep? I can't remember that famous woman's name. That was a woman. She was real famous years, years ago. A boy, she caught a boyfriend cheating on a man. She cut off his dick while he was asleep. She literally took like a big knife, just sliced off his shit, man. That's the risk you take, man, when you cheat. Erica J, she says, Pierre character doing a classic mic drop. Thank you. Thank you. I'm out of here. I got to go. I got to help somebody, give them some one-on-one -on -one advice. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll probably see you again on Thursday, more than either Thursday or Friday. More than likely Thursday, but could be Friday. All right, people. Yes, sir. Say it again. Yes, sir. Who's the king? Alan, you're the king. Say it again. Alan, you're the king. <laughs> you're dominating me. Say it again. Alan, you're dominating me right now. Mode one. Mode one. Daddy, can I go, please? You're the king. Say it again. Oh, my Oh, you're the fucking king. Yes. 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 Oh. Oh. You're the king, Alan. A.K.A. the king of verbal seduction. You know, it's the tone of your voice. How seductive your intonations are. The vibrations that you could just reach out over the phone lines and stroke a woman's breast just by the sound of your voice. How you could make her pussy so wet just by the sound of your voice. That's actually very hot. So you said my show was what? I said your show is powerful. Oh, say it again. Your show is powerful. I bet the king would fuck me really good. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. Alan Roger Curry, the king. The king. The king. Um, I have to agree with you on the communication piece, because I actually did take a session for uh, Alan Roger Curry, and he gave me a mm -hmm. line that I, that I did not think was going to work, and it worked. And I was like, what the, what the fuck? <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God, man, he's the master. He's the master of the verbal yeah. seduction. He got that communication yeah. piece down pat. It really worked. Yeah. It was simply, it was it just simply worked, and I just didn't think it was gonna work at all. Some guys have some guys have a some guys have natural handles. Some guys have a better natural shot. But you can always improve your shot. And sex is damn sure something you can fucking learn. Look, dude, you want to learn how to talk better? I'm hiring Alan Roger Curry to get my dirty talk game on. Because it's, it's always been something I want to get better at. Verbal seduction? <laughs> man, I'm like, clearly, this guy is the Michael Jordan of seduction. Like, you know, come on now.